Okay, going to test the sound quality. Uh, hoping people can hear me. Uh, definitely looking forward to feedback. And I want to thank everyone for uh, uh, participating and being here with us. Uh, looking forward, of course, to uh, our uh, dear friend Daniel Arola in the chat room. He should be back home at this point uh, from wherever he was at. And uh, so uh, our dear brother Brendan is also uh, out there in the world. And he will be hopefully giving me some feedback on text. And hopefully I'll get that from uh, all of you uh, tonight. And uh, going to monitor the live uh, dashboard in a second here. Now, I believe we should be live streaming. Uh, live stream health. Welcome to live chat. I see now. Got zero users. Ooh, got an incoming call. Let's hope this doesn't knock me off. Okay, I'm answering this call. Hopefully that doesn't knock me off. I'm just uh, looking forward to your telling me if you can hear me. I'm trying to live stream right now, so I was hoping you could just inform myself in the text whether you could hear me or not. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. Now, hopefully, other people are out there. It says elapsed time. Should be someone out there hearing us. Now, let me see now. Let me go over here, get this going. Go over to new chat, new tab, I mean. You're just gonna hear me mumble to myself. I'm not gonna be this saying. Going. Oh, look, I hear an go echo. Go to new chat, new tab, I mean. I've got one person watching You're now. You're just gonna hear me mumble to myself. I'm not gonna go be this saying. Going. Oh, look, I hear an go echo. Go to new chat, new tab, I mean. I've got one. Okay. There we are. Whoops. Okay. Can hear me say silly things. All right. I'm watching myself. Yes, I'm watching myself. Okay. <sighs> okay. Okay, and there we are. Let's see what else we've got going here. Now you gotta hear me say things repeatedly, just like repeating myself as I just uh, get things up and running. Working with two computers because of the, uh, just the nature of the equipment that I have being <sighs> outmoded, old, you know, it's really sad. <laughs> I hear you, says Daniel Arola. Thank you, dear brother. Thank you. Uh, deeply appreciate it. Good, good. Glad to have somebody answering from out of the wilderness. Okay, going to work on the... Uh... <sighs> The post. Yeah, let's get this out here. Edit post. And Brendan, so get. I mean, Brendan says, You're live. Much love. There we are. I thought he said, You live much love. There we are. That would, that makes me sound like some kind of, uh, some kind of person of a higher spiritual ascension than I actually am. <laughs> So, okay. All right. So I'm live. Not that I'm saying anything of substance. This is why I like working with others when at all possible, of course. They can help uh, fill in the, uh, the airspace, so to speak. Fill airtime, as we would say in terrestrial broadcast radio, which I, you know, was never professionally involved with but still had uh, some exposure on. Okay. Let me give a thank you here to our, our dear brother. Okay. 
got 15 minutes to the top of the hour. Going to uh, go to the bottom of this particular promotional banner. Save it. There we are. Then I'm going to unpin it from the top of the page because I'll be putting something else in its place. Now I'm going to do that with the other post. There we are. Push save. Oh, my neck. And now I take that link. Test it out. Enter it into the search bar. Oh, press enter. Here an echo. Enter it into the search bar. And our dear girl, Sarah Shields, I can hear you very clearly and you need not apologize for any damn thing. Love you, Sarah. Enter it into the search bar. And our dear girl. There we are. So this works. And let's see now. Okay. Enter this here. And I get the last highlighted link. Press the edit button. Okay. Love you all out there who are listening and support myself. Honestly, you're all my extended electronic family. I have an extended electronic family. And uh, God knows I need it. Okay, so here we are. Okay. The lovely lady Sarah Shields is oft on my mind. We think of her often. Oh, yes. Uh, remind me. Prayers for Michaela. Michaela. Uh, okay. She has a migraine. Prayers for Maria. There we are. On my way home from Lamada last week, I saw the Patrick Tillman Memorial Bridge. Uh, okay. Let me um, take a look at Daniel speaking about that. Patrick Tillman, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers him. Uh, I'll, I'll bring this up when we're officially transmitting. Uh, a lot of you younger people probably don't remember him, our younger listeners. And uh, that's understandable. I mean, uh, a lot is done to cover these people up. Pin to top of page. There we are. Okay. And now we go over to sorry. Okay. There we are. Okay. That's interesting. Nothing came of that. Going to uh, reload the page. Hopefully, some of, something comes of this. By that I mean hopefully the thumbnail appears. Oh now I gotta there we are. Kind of shrink the screen. Open this up. Thumbnail, there we are, thank god. Okay. Great, we got ten minutes to the top of the hour. And uh not quite sure how I'm going to fill the time, so to speak. Nine people watching now on a Wednesday night have some new subscribers and welcome to all of them let's see what Daniel's saying on my way home from Nevada last week I saw the Patrick Mil Tillman Memorial Bridge after passing over Hoover Dam I told immediate company who Tillman was and they thought it was cool for a moment right before I said except he was shot in the back by friendly fire <laughs> oh my god you didn't even tell him the whole story did you oh my god as a matter of fact uh 
Uh, we should bring him on at some point. Uh, I don't know if he's able to uh, come on tonight for any period of time. Or, uh, um, ouch, kind of hang out on the bandwidth or whatever. But um, uh, with the bandwidth I have, not quite sure. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we could handle it. So uh, let's see now. Well, if you can hear me, Daniel, are, are you able to, like, uh, if I pick you up on a call, will you be able to, uh, you know, uh, appear? Like, uh, are you available to uh, appear for a few minutes just to uh, shoot the shit, so to speak, and burn up the bandwidth? I have company right now. There we are. Yes, he's in respectable company. There he, yeah, maybe later. Okay, that's cool. And, uh, yes. So let me know if you become available later. And uh, we'll see if I'm on a roll at that time. If I'm too intensely monologuing, of course, I'll, I'll continue my arc of narrative. But I think by, you know, the end of my arc of narrative, which shouldn't be too long tonight, um, it'd be nice to bring Daniel on. And uh, we could um, bring up some stuff. You know, welcome him back from, you know, he was way out in um, near my uh, area, actually. He was right across the border from uh, California so uh, theoretically we could have uh, met each other we'll do that someday and uh, certainly look forward to that and uh, obviously uh, he's one of my nearest and dearest brothers in battle and Daniel Arola has been uh, doing quite a bit now let me shrink this down take a look at uh, my self on the OBS uh, make that screen larger there we are and uh, always comforting it's like looking in a mirror and uh, that's how I anchor myself okay got 13 people now with us in the immediate circle Story time, childrens. Yes. And uh, let's see now. Oh, yes. How could I forget channel? Dashboard. Now I remember what I was looking for. The actual channel. So I could monitor that. Excellent. Hey, I see myself. And I got the right date. I was able to change the date. I've got the right date. Today's date. And I look at my channel now and I see no more scumbag pavel image no more detricology which was his rip off of myself as a brand i mean um ugh, disgusting uh, the very memory of him sends my skin crawling you know the stuff i've had to deal with all these years um and of course it's always awkward uh where we have our dear brother in battle uh brendan uh helping me out Always awkward because he tries to do so from work. And, uh, okay. Did a pretty good job with that illustration now. Here, we, we said, K. Melaton? K. Melaton? Is that how you pronounce it? Dietrich 2020, God bless you. Uh, talk about Fort Meade, MD. Fort Meade, Maryland. <laughs> oh, is there something going on at Fort Meade, Maryland? <laughs> And then, uh, where's Mr. B? He's pretty knowledgeable. Sunday, honey. This is to Sarah Shields. Mm. Sunday, honey. That's when uh, Brendan will be with us. Yes, Brendan is knowledgeable. He's wonderful. Right now, he's working in, of all places, uh, he's uh, doing things in what we in San Francisco would call a deli. He's kind of like in a delicatessen market. And uh, so that's uh, what he does six days of the week. And uh, he's killing himself, working too hard while going to school. I told him he's got to quit his job, seek a new one. Hopefully he, he turns in his two-week notice. And uh, then he can help me produce. Of course, it's for entirely selfish reasons I want him to quit his job. Uh, of course, I have no money to support him. But, um, you know, um, he can always look for work later. <laughs> <sighs> Besides, he needs time to apply for scholarships. Yeah, he was out of school. NSA is there. Oh, okay. There we are. Thank you. Kayla Layton. Yes, that's right. 
For me in Maryland. Yes, that's right. The Puzzle Palace. How could I forget? I think that's... I, I, I know the Puzzle Palace was what we used to call, I think, the NSA headquarters, if I remember correctly. I don't think we used that for the CIA or anyone else. Um, and aside from all of that... Uh, but I'm, I see no particular reason to bring it up tonight unless something happened there that I didn't know about. I hate to say this, but one would almost hope for a mass shooting over there uh, in the NSA. Of course, that's a horrible thing to say. I shouldn't say, shouldn't say that. I mean, the majority of these people are just bureaucrats. Uh, and uh, hell, I would dare say... Uh, even many field agents aren't really... I, I don't know if the NSA really has field agents, really, so to speak. See Ramona Halitha Henry out there. Shout out to her. Brought to my attention some astrological uh, things going down. Astrozodiacal phenomena. We're in for some various retrogrades. And, of course, I could... Uh, bring up some aspects about uh, about that because if I bring our uh, our man Daniel on towards the end of the show we'll have more than enough to occupy us you know for a bit drag us into what I tried to do as the baseline a prerequisite four hours at least Unless it were a dire emergency, uh, I always try to do four hours at the very least. And um, aside from that, just killing time till the top of the hour, which is any minute from now, Jess Roger. Love you, darling. Haven't forgotten. I need to appear on your show some point soon. Matter of fact, I got Friday the 13th scheduled with uh, our man uh, Joe Boyer, but I'll have to contact him and ask him if that's just something we did off the cuff and whether or not that we were serious about that or whether or not that is um, uh, that's happening or um, or what uh, with everything else that's go been going on you can imagine why I haven't really followed up with him <sighs> so let's hope things stabilize over the um, as soon as possible no other word for it oh my god Mm. going to hear me slurping at the liquid and um, we got two minutes to the top of the hour and um, dearly wish there were someone online with myself to burn bandwidth just so that I could occupy myself just um, sipping liquid till the time started to talk soothing my my tongue, which for some reason feels like it's uh, been rub raw. Uh, sensation comes from a kind of dehydration. Which I'm sure is collateral. All the alcohol and drugs I consume. Uh, yeah, so certainly don't follow my lifestyle, kids. Fentanyl's killing everybody these days. It's overtaken uh, the other opiates to the uh, top of the uh, narcotics uh, killing uh, chain. You know the uh, and uh, I can't believe I fucking spelled that right. Fentanyl on my first fucking try. It can treat severe pain. Oh shit! Yeah, I never would have guessed. Now, uh, in terms of uh, anything else going on, it is the top of the hour. I am uh, definitely um, glad to uh, be here, and I want to thank everyone for being here. We're going to officially start in a few moments. I'm going to wind myself up to it. <laughs> so I want everyone to forgive myself uh, for the, uh, my, shall I say, just kind of being spacey, being spacey tonight. And uh, 
So uh, Daniel Rolls says, Philippine president is hooked on fentanyl while he threatens to kill people who use drugs. Oh, well, there you go. Why, why am I not surprised? Uh, that is uh, Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte. That is, uh, that's our man. And um, uh, definitely not surprised that it's, uh, that he is what he is, which is a flaming fucking hypocrite. And uh, with that, uh, going to uh, try and work my way into narrative mode <laughs> and uh, bring myself back down to earth, kind of anchor myself. Uh, God knows I'm, uh, you know, not really all here tonight. Uh, I'm sure there are many who would argue I'm not really all here at any time. Uh, but um, tonight is kind of uh, worse than usual. Just uh, definitely uh, uh, really out there. And I'm uh, kind of, uh, you know, just pretty much uh, uh, just trying to, uh, how do I say it? Uh, get myself into narrative tonight. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm really looking forward to this. Happy to be here. Uh, but just, uh, you know, without somebody to bounce off of, this is actually the first time in a long time uh, that, that it's like that. I'm feeling kind of just, uh, I wouldn't say it's not depressed. It's, it's just more like, um, uh, it's, it's just kind of untethered. Yeah, I'm kind of untethered right now. And um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, let's see if I can... Uh, pull this off and I'll do my best to get it started. First off, I'd like to uh, uh, dedicate tonight's program to Ben Astenius. I got a card from him with some uh, financial aid. I haven't even had a chance to open it yet. Um, ben, of course, is so busy. I don't believe he ever really listens to my uh, narratives, and I, uh, uh, but he does his best to help. Uh, he is a wonderful sponsor. He's been around forever. He is, of course, uh, the man who is with manofthesoil.com. Uh, anyone in uh, the state of Arizona, please do check him out. Uh, you'll want him to fix up your yard. And uh, then again, of course, uh, he's a man who uh, does so using, of course, the only means uh, practical, uh, Mexican labor. And uh, he helps that, uh, uh, you know, he um, uh, really uses Mexican labor that are um, able to do what uh, you know, the men in brown are able to do what the men in white cannot. <laughs> they can work in the sun and get things done. And he also, of course, leads the Tucson True Crime Tours. So the Tucson True Crime, Crime Tours, you can look them up and uh, contract him as a guide. And as well, don't forget that uh, the way you can find everything else that he's working on is uh, there for you to review at theunfinishedman.com. So do check out theunfinishedman.com. Now, I told Justin White, and a shout out to him, uh, that he thinks a lot better when he's high. And he says, tell that to the ladies as they tend to disagree with you. I trust your sober assessment, however. Well, there you go. Thank you, dear brother. And that's deeply appreciated. Uh, and I'll move on from the messenger now, having checked that out. Going to open up this uh, latest message here. And you're going to probably hear me do a lot of this tonight. Just kind of like this uh, muddle-headed putzing and futzing that I'll be doing while I'm here. And Sammy Romero says, sounding clear, Doug. Hugs, dear brother. Love you dearly, Sammy. And thank you very much for checking in. I deeply appreciate your uh, feedback, your technical feedback on our audio sound. Uh, not quite sure if uh, my sounding clear uh, is any advantage when I'm not necessarily making all that much sense myself. A shout out to Derek Talley and more than a shout out, uh, Semper Fidelis. Uh, he is of course a brother from another mother. He is a black African American former Marine. Uh, he sent my way a quarter of a hundred dollars. He is also a truck driver. And one of these days in his honor, I am going to speak about, um, the security, uh, um, shall we say, the security issues with trucking in America and uh, exactly the challenges they present. Um, and of course, he's in the industry. Uh, maybe I could bring him on to speak to that. I don't know if he wants to come on or if he wants to be heard, but that would be interesting. It would be interesting to hear what the man sounds like. 
And um, a shout out, Derek Talley. Um, all my love, hugs, and my best to you and all your own. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out as well to our volcano crowned Princess of the Pacific, the Grand Madam Judith Ager, and of course, our brother in battle. Brendan, who were on with myself in my latest transmission. And uh, I promised to Judith I've got to start doing the thumbnails, update the thumbnails for all of my live streams as of late. Hopefully I'll have time to do that this week. And um, I do pray Judith Agard is listening. And if she is, I do hope that she um, acknowledges such in the um, chat bar, so to speak, or in the Skype text. Love you, honey. And uh, as our Pacific correspondent, uh, she uh, brought up to my attention, along with Brendan, some things that have been happening that um, in South Asia, which I'll go into tonight, the uh, disenfranchisement, the, uh, the uh, rendering people stateless that has taken place in the South Asian um, subcontinental, subcontinental nation state of India. And um, so I'll go into that. And as well, um, Brendan brought to my attention that in my own uh, golden city of San Francisco, here on the Golden Gate, we have uh, outlawed the National Rifle Association as an international terrorist organization. God bless us. And uh, we'll go more into that on Sunday when Brendan is with us. I'm just happy to report that. And a shout out to Daniel Arola, who we may bring on later tonight. And uh, in his honor, uh, since he's returned, I'll be speaking a bit to Bruce Lee, which is why it's almost obligatory I have Daniel on. Hopefully he can make it on with us. And how Bruce Lee has impacted uh, in his afterlife the um, protests in Hong Kong, leading them to a major victory. And I want to ask everyone uh, to pray for Maria Mikhaila Grigorich. Uh, Maria Mikhaila Grigorich is suffering from a very intensive migraine and therefore was unable to join us tonight uh love her dearly and uh everyone do pray for her and again her name is maria Mikila Mig grigorich and Mikila is uh m-i-c-h-e-l-a uh, maria Mikila and grigorich is just spelled the way it sounds kind of uh gregor uh g-r-e-g-o-r-i-c-a i i c but the C has the, of course, the um, uh, the accent on it. So it's Grigorovic in the Slavonic. She's Slovenian, it Italo-Slovenian, Italo-Slovenian. So uh, probably some Austrian in there too with the Habsburg Empire and its influence. So a uh, mass prayer request for her. And of course, uh, you know, our uh, wonderful young madam, Lena Shea, uh, the fangirl who does so much for us has uh, been getting better from a cold. She and her family have been suffering, so uh, uh, prayers have worked well there, uh, though they've been sourcing mostly from myself because I didn't have a chance to really make a mass prayer request about her case. Now, there are other people who need our thoughts and prayers in the most sincere sense. After I check out this uh, comment from our man Daniel, uh, where um, he's talking about <laughs> the small penis syndrome for the assault rifle uh, faggots and uh, buy an AR-15 and watch it grow. Yes, there we go. The, uh, the severely disempowered and the way they empower themselves with a uh, high ratio of firepower. Uh, pathetic. Um, all right. Uh, I'm building up some passion now, getting some fire, uh, getting some fire out from my balls so to speak my testicles uh and believe it or not i do have a pair uh so in um the latest mass um tragedy uh that uh invokes our need for prayers and there's so many of them let's first address the storm's deadly toll hurricane dorian has claimed its first victims with at least seven people having died in the abaco islands the bahamas prime minister Mr. Hubert Minis, be quoted as saying, we are in the midst of a historic tragedy. The storm continued to pound Grand Bahama Island yesterday morning. Meanwhile, millions of people along the southeastern coast of these United States are bracing for what comes next. Indeed, Hurricane Dorian is making its way up the United States coast, even while the fight for survival has begun in the Bahamas. 
Now, Dorian was downgraded from a category fucking five down to a comparatively moderate category two storm yesterday after it pummeled the Bahamas. From satellite images to home videos, images of Hurricane Dorian's devastation evoke both shock and awe. Hurricane Dorian devastated parts of the Bahamas, leaving people there fighting for their very survival. Bahamians rescued victims of Hurricane Dorian with jet skis and a bulldozer as the United States Coast Guard, Britain's Royal Navy, and a handful of aid groups tried to get food and medicine to survivors and take the most desperate people to safety. The destruction that Hurricane Dorian heaped upon the northern Bahamas be unimaginable. A good portion of Grand Bahama Island, including a major airport, is underwater. Parts of the Abaco Islands are decimated. Thousands of homes and businesses have been heavily damaged or destroyed. At least seven people have been killed by Dorian, the strongest storm to ever make landfall in the Bahamas. But the country's prime minister said the death toll will rise as rescue teams get out into the hardest-hit areas. Among the dead, so far, are an eight-year-old boy who was found by his mother and a woman who drowned in her house while her husband helplessly watched. All the survivors need our prayers, more so than the dead, who hopefully be at peace. The survivors will never find peace. Sands our thoughts and hopefully their ability to come to terms with such a incomparable loss as a loved one. Now, all this, while even now Dorian is slowly creeping along the southeast U- coast of these United States, the Category 2 storm is skirting the coasts of Florida and Georgia, but just a little wobble to the west could mean Dorian makest landfall in either South or North Carolina. Indeed, the National Hurricane Center warned that the entire southeastern coast, from Florida to North Carolina, may be affected by quote-unquote life-threatening surf and rip conditions within the next 36 hours. So five states have now declared a state of emergency. Now, we have a tragedy here in my own Golden State Nation, the Bear Republic of California, off Santa Cruz Island. The investigation into a deadly diving boat fire off the coast of California continues. Now, I spoke of seeking answers from the sea in my promotional banner. And the grandma named Ramona Halitha Henry was kind enough to actually read my promotional banner, as I know many people don't. (laughs) And she said she, um, of course, wishes her best uh, in for any survivors, being the good lady that she is, will get to my stance on this soon enough. And that she wishes eternal peace for the dead. She says, nevertheless... She looks forward to my whodunit, as she expressed it. And this is due to a miscommunication on my part. It's very hard to communicate anything well about a situation like this. Um, In the short time I address broadcast to this tonight, this isn't a whodunit. This is more really a whale of anguish. The diving boat Concepcion burned near the coast of Santa Cruz Island before sinking. What we've been left with was a fire, a mayday call, and a grim search. Now audio from a distress a distress call from the boat leaves us the following quote, which I read from transcript. I can't breathe. There's no escape hatch. Now, that alone says far too much. Authorities are attempting, even now, 
to de determine exactly what went wrong on the Conception. A 75-foot commercial diving boat that burned off the coast of Santa Cruz Island as most of its passengers evidently slept early Monday morning, this Labor Day weekend, but 48 hours are gone. Now, concerning the California boat fire and our search for answers in the sea, I, of course, am impacted emotionally, my father being a lifelong sailor. I'm left with a very personal and all too conscious appreciation for the horror of what went down in a manner in which I myself would never want to die. And of course it begs the question, not in any academic sense, but in the most rudimentary sense, what caused the fire that engulfed the 75-foot dive boat Concepcion, and why was it so deadly? Those are among the key questions as investigators search for answers in one of the worst maritime disasters in modern California history. With 34 people, most evidently from the Bay Area, my own hometown, presumed killed. At least 15 people were confirmed dead and 19 were still missing as of late Monday on Labor Day itself. One focus of the investigation of this deadly boat fire off Santa Cruz Island be on the vessel's design. A growing focus of the investigation is on the limited escape routes available to those in the sleeping quarters below deck but two exits, which officials believe were both blocked by fire. Now that's almost unbelievable. I, uh, it's believable and it isn't. It does reek of the potential for mass murder. Some more details on that all too quickly. Now, one former Marine safety official be quoted as saying, With 30-plus people dying, the investigation could lead to changes in the way maritime vessels be designed or protected, depending on those findings. Meanwhile, remembrances of some of those presumed dead are beginning to emerge, including five family members who all died together celebrating the father's birthday. A family celebrating a birthday, a high school physics teacher and his daughter, a young woman following her dreams of the ocean. Among those caught in one of the worst maritime disasters in recent California history was Christy Finstad, a 41-year-old marine biologist who grew up swimming the waters of the Channel Islands of California. They were just some of the victims of the deadly diving boat fire that killed 34 people on Labor Day. They had all signed up to spend the holiday weekend on the boat scuba diving, with gourmet meals served between dives. But they died when the blaze blocked their escape routes from the boat's lower sleeping decks, Twenty bodies have been recovered so far, and divers say they have seen more bodies in the wreckage of the dive boat, Concepcion, which sank off the coast of Santa Cruz Island. The Concepcion itself now lies upside down at the bottom of the sea, in about 62 feet of water, as family and friends await answers on their loved ones. Crews want to stabilize what's left of the boat so divers can safely enter it and recover the rest of the bodies. Now here comes the hard point. Only five people, all crew members, survived this tragedy. To reiterate, five people are known to have survived. All of them crew members who had been awake 
and jumped overboard, abandoning ship and all passengers aboard. After these crew members reached the nearby fishing boat of a certain lady named Shirley Hansen in their dinghy, mind you, they took off in the lifeboat, mind you. Two of them actually had the conscience to go back in hopes of rescuing others. But to quote is the lady Shirley Hansen herself, but they came back and there was no one that they found. Now, having been raised by my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, Chief Petty Officer, United States Navy, retired. I can tell you, with the training he provided myself, there is no greater responsibility on earth for anyone who crews aboard a vessel bearing civilians than the lives of those civilians. As with a combat vessel, where any man who abandons post be deemed worthy of execution, any crew member from the captain down to the lowliest ward a deckhand who mops and waits tables. Their primary function in their life while aboard is their responsibility towards all the lives in their care. When your boat is burning you are not to abandon ship any more than would the captain of a combat vessel. For them to have so cravenly saved themselves, making it all the way to another vessel before two of them decided to save their reputations, by going back to cruise the area of the ocean where the ship was once afloat before it burned and sank is beyond offensive to my sensibilities. I am certain my father, George Dietrich, would have agreed with myself that if I had my way, in a position of secular power where I could enforce my sense of ethics, all five of these worthless subhuman pieces of shit that crewed the Concepcion would be taken out and shot on national television. These survivors are not worth the oxygen they are stealing from the rest of us. They should be dead, having died trying to save the passengers that were in their care. The idea of, oh, there's no point in all of us dying, that stops at the waterline. The moment you're on that goddamn boat, you're in a different reality. If a supreme commander of the armed forces is aboard a ship, if the leader of a nation state is aboard a combat vessel, they are 
for the time they are aboard. Under orders of the captain of that ship. The captain can override what is national leader or the supreme commander of armed forces is saying when it be relevant to the immediate function survival or capacities of the vessel under his command. The captain is the ruler of a miniature world, a miniature culture, a ship of state, all its own, while afloat, whether it's the high seas or coastal waters. And for the staff to abandon their charges is beyond reprehensible. No, it's not a question of, well, no point in all of us dying. Once you're signed on to that level of responsibility, it doesn't matter if you can't save the others. You can at least die with them. That would have at least provided some consolation to the surviving family members rather than the added insult to injury that you're alive and polluting the air around us with what you exude from your exhalations and the gas you pass while all those they cared about are lost forever. My advice to all those crew members. Take a firearm, or whatever choice, poison, whatever you find the easiest or the most convenient, whatever you use, kill yourselves. And may your time on this earth be filled with suffering and pain if any of you are even capable of the guilt where that can be incurred. Now this happened on a Labor Day. And in these United States, Labor Day and the unions have actually forgotten religious roots. The labor movement has forgotten the religious roots that propelled the movement that won a national holiday. Labor Day already existed in Europe, but it did not fit the American agenda. Labor Day became an American federal holiday circa 1894. Most other countries celebrate labor on May 1st. That date had been a pagan celebration. But in the late 19th century, European socialists adopted May 1st as the annual holiday devoted to labor with marches and riots. Industrialization brought labor problems to these United States with some incredibly nasty consequences. American workers wanted more money, better working conditions, and recognition. Money and better conditions were hard to give, so labor suggested a holiday, and management and Congress were enthused. A holiday not built around an armed uprising was just the thing. But May 1st was a reminder of everything they wanted workers not to think about. So the first Monday in September was chosen. Being the last weekend before children returned to school, this created a three-day family-oriented holiday. Rather than marching under the red flag of communism and united worldwide labor as a global class unto itself, 
a transnational identity. Families headed to the beach, or lake, or wherever, for a last summer outing. The vendors at these places thought it was a delightful idea. The recipients of such internal tourism, domestic travels. And so Labor Day didn't become a day to plan revolutions, but a time to kick back and have a beer. And for the vacation industry to have one last summer blow off. So reflect on this. The threat was a European-style revolution. The solution was a holiday, one the children wouldn't let the workers ignore. So no meetings. Those making money out of summer got a three-day weekend to peddle their wares, and the workers were recognized for being workers, and at the least, that beef was taken care of. And some of the Christian churches, who were not happy with a pagan holiday being Labor Day, were also appeased. To get a sense of the difference between these United States and Europe, when facing political and economic chaos, the American solution was to turn a revolution into a marketable event, keep the churches quiet, and let the kids call off the union meeting. That's a pretty brilliant ploy on the part of corporate capitalism. So clever, it can only be admired. And that brings us to the theme of big business. Now, big oil has been placing its bets on green energy, BP or British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, Total, Chevron, and Saudi Aramco are increasingly investing in low-carbon technologies and clean energy startups, if you can believe that. Now, I'm personally pretty acutely aware of this phenomenon. The man who must forever remain anonymous at least for the foreseeable future, as far as I can foresee, and all of our affiliates and my personal relations. The billionaire who married my surrogate son, whom we reference as Sugar Daddy, has sent his regards to my surrogate son from the glistening Fujian Lake in communist China's southern Yunnan province where Fortune Magazine is even now hosting the opening session, that was today, of its inaugural Global Sustainability Forum. Now, the Global Sustainability Forum was convened under the conviction that sustainability has shifted from the periphery to the core of business interests. And we've already seen proof of that today. Dow Chemical Chief Executive Officer Jim Fitterly told the forum audience that he himself spent his 25% or a full quarter of his time on sustainability issues. And he's not alone. The company's board, Fitterling so testifies, has spent more time on sustainability this year than just about anything else, to use his words, Fitterling be quoted as saying, They believe it's a purpose we have to tackle, and they've believed it for a long time. He himself noting that this be Dow's third decade of publishing long-term sustainability goals. That might seem like an unlikely scenario for a petrochemical company, let alone one of the world's largest producers of plastics, a material currently the scourge of environmentalists everywhere. But it's because Dow is engaged in a dirty business that it needs to be clean. Every company wants to be profitable long-term, but if you're not sustainable, 
that's not going to happen. Dow was actually included in Fortune Magazine's Change the World list this year for its efforts to create more durable road material by melting plastic scrap into tarmac, a process that not only cuts carbon emissions by reducing bitumen content, but also saves some plastic from piling up at landfill sites. That's the sort of circular economy solution to waste that Fitterling advocated on stage across the Pacific from my own Golden Gate in our San Francisco Bay Area in Red Chinese Yunnan where he argued that litter piling up on the beaches and drifting in the ocean isn't really a problem with plastic. It's a problem with waste. And pointing out to how waste from these United States is frequently dumped on beaches in Asia or elsewhere, Fitterling has so noted that we have a linear economy which is designed to take these things and throw them out. Or we have recycling systems where we think things are going to be recycled, but they aren't. And that's why global leaders need to step up and make his changes because those problems are harder for small local communities to deal with. Now, I myself have always asserted that big business holds the real power to make change, and the Global Sustainability Forum is showcasing real ways that can be done. And do note that the forum continues tomorrow. Now, that brings us to a change brought about by Walmart with its guns. You can get pretty much anything at Walmart. But it's about to get a lot harder to find firearms and ammo there. Walmart is also asking that customers no longer openly carry guns into its stores. Kroger did that too. Now following this year's mass shootings at Walmart stores, the mega retailer will stop selling handgun ammunition and publicly ask customers not to openly carry firearms into its stores, even where state laws allow us such. To reiterate, in details, Walmart will stop selling handguns, as well as ammunition for handguns and short barrel rifles, once it sells out of its current stock. It now also no longer supports customers openly carrying firearms in states with that open carry law. Walmart says it will stop selling handgun ammo and short barrel rifle ammunition, the kind that can be used in assault-style weapons. The Walmart chief executive officer, whom I personally publicly and openly appealed to in my latest transmission, which you can find in my last live stream before this one, Doug McMillan, has responded with action to my open challenge. And he says these changes were spurred by the El Paso, Texas mass shooting, which happened inside a Walmart, as well as recent shootings in Dayton, Ohio, and Midland and Odessa, Texas. He also sent a letter to Congress himself demanding lawmakers do their part to stop gun violence. Walmart will, however, continue to sell long-barreled deer rifles and shotguns and much of the ammunition for those weapons, which, as far as I'm concerned, be completely fine. Now, this was something that you can find on record. I openly demanded that Mr. McMillan do. I'm glad that he's responded to this extent. If you listen to what I suggested Doug McMillan can do, there's still a long way to go. He could go a lot farther than what he's even done. But I am proud of him for dispatching a letter onto Congress demanding that legislators do their fucking part 
and fucking legislate. Now, authorities say it's the gunman behind that mass shooting in Texas after a routine traffic stop in West Texas had just been fired from his job and had called police and the FBI before his rampage began. So one wonders why they didn't pay him a visit and, if necessary, take his fucking ass out before he went and took out the lives of so many innocents. Stop treating mass shootings like they're goddamn hurricanes. Christopher Combs, the lead FBI agent in charge of federal resources assisting in the investigation of Saturday's deadly mass shooting in Texas, be quoted as saying, if you look at the numbers, we're looking at an active shooter every other week in this country. His chilling comments about the state of violence in America come as after seven people were killed and at least 22 injured when a white trash piece of shit opened fire with an AR-type assault rifle along a West Texas stretch of highway. Now, much remainest unknown about the 36-year-old shooter. I'm not going to name him and provide him any fame. Law enforcement sources have told myself that authorities have yet to establish a motive even now. But the latest incident follows a recent cycle of carnage across this country. Mass murder in America is now predictable. And each incident follows a pattern you can set your watch to. A shooter guns down innocents. Family and friends bury their loved ones. Communities grieve. Many politicians offer completely empty thoughts and prayers. Little to no legislative action be taken. And people move on until the next mass murder. With the Texas shooting happening at the same time, a powerful Category fucking 5 hurricane approached the eastern United States. It occurred to myself that our response to firearms violence in the modern era, the postmodern era, isn't that different from how we prepare for violent storms. When facing a threat, the first question we ask is, what power do we have over it? With a hurricane, we naturally resign ourselves to the fact that the only thing one can do is prepare for the worst and try to flee from danger. You can't stop a hurricane, only try to limit its impact. The annual hurricane season will never go away. This seems to be the same fatalistic approach we now employ when dealing with mass massacres. We want to stop them, but we feel powerless. Like hurricanes, it feels as though mass shootings be here to stay. Something tragic, but somehow completely natural. Of course, this methodology of viewing firearms violence is fatally flawed. Because unlike natural disasters and contrary to what Republican politicians and the goddamn terrorist gun lobby might tell us. There'll be things we can do to stop this cycle of mass murder that be inflicting the American empire, our country, our people. There'll be a host of solutions, large and small, that could help reduce firearms violence if only the issue of firearms wasn't so politically divisive. Exemplary gratia, lawmakers actively limiting access to weapons of war could help rid our streets of the kind of assault rifle that show us up time and again at every fucking scene of mass violence. Furthermore, strengthening background checks and enacting the so-called red flag laws would help authorities get guns out of the hands of potentially dangerous people before they strike. If elected leaders were serious about saving lives, they would come us together in a bipartisan manner and take us the issue head on in a way that would balance public safety with the constitutional right to bear arms. 
Until then, their lack of action will continue as to signal to our fellow citizens that politicians in power consent to an acceptable level of bloodshed. By doing nothing, they are in effect telling us this violent status quo be not only okay in their eyes, not only acceptable, but even commendable, because they be complicit in the murder themselves. There's no other conclusion to draw than the fact they want it to happen. And until they do act, we as a nation will remain on this murderous merry-go-round that just won't ever fucking stop. We will continue to wake up to news that more of our fellow citizens have been cut down at the hands of a white trash piece of shit, some random, impotent gunman cutting loose in his misogyny and racism and just plain sense of white privileged grievance that motivates them all. And mass shootings will continue to seem as common as bad weather. Because our gun laws make it too fucking easy for white haters to kill. It's been one month now since 31 people were killed in mass shootings in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio, before I even count the recent ones in Texas, which I'll go into soon enough. It's worth pointing out that those two shootings that hit us last month at this point followed another one week before, in the month before yesterday's, before last month, in Gilroy, California, my own Golden State nation, where three people, including a six-year-old and a 13-year-old, were killed by a white trash piece of shit with an assault rifle. And amid all this, any sane American be calling for more gun laws. Only Democrats have offered a wide array, from universal background checks and raising the minimum age requirements to suing firearms manufacturers and banning assault-style weapons. Some Republican lawmakers have expressed an openness, but how sincere and serious they be remains to be seen. If you're a Republican, fuck yourself. Fuck yourself until you fucking impregnate yourself and then die in childbirth, no matter your gender. If you're a Republican, eat shit and fucking die. You want this to happen, or you wouldn't be a Republican. Now, for years, I myself personally made the case for the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. I've pointed out that criminals don't follow gun laws. And there was a time in my life that I defended the NRA, the National Rifle Association and its members. Law-abiding gun owners like myself who had nothing to do with mass shootings or violent gun crimes, as I understood the world back then. I've done that because I myself am obviously a gun owner, and to extent, ever and always a gun rights advocate. And for a good part of my life, I believed all the pablum that came with the politics of firearms being true. But I am no longer an NRA member. Being right no longer feels righteous. Because in the wake of ever more mass shootings, acts of senseless violence that sent innocent people running for their lives, leaving children orphaned and loved ones dead on the ground, I notice we must do something about the fucking guns. Now we have a problem in this country. And the problem is hate. One of the things we must do to begin to solve our hate problem is to put down our metaphorical weapons, our defenses, our special interests, 
and be honest about the role that firearms play in this culture of hate in America? And the honest, simple answer is, it'd be far too easy for far too many sick and twisted perverts, white trash pieces of shit of the male persuasion. I wouldn't call them masculine. There's nothing masculine about these faggots getting their hands on guns. People with a kind of hate in their hearts as the El Paso and Dayton shooters, the Sutherland Springs and Charleston church suitors, the Las Vegas and San Bernardino shooters, they're not going to be cured of their hate by taking away their guns. But we also don't need to just hand them a killing device and a hundred rounds of ammunition and say, don't do anything bad with these weapons of mass destruction meant for war. A kid whose ex-girlfriend testified he showed her a video of a mass shooting on a first date, whose former classmates testify he had a hit list of people he wanted to kill and rape, should never have had access to a firearm of any kind. Period. I myself would have recommended taking him out and fucking killing him. Just for what we know. As a preemptive. But even that aside, He shouldn't have had a gun. He shouldn't have had any access to guns. Domestic abusers should never have access to a firearm of any kind. Period. People who make us violent threats against individuals or groups of people should be taken extremely seriously, investigated thoroughly, and ultimately never have access to a firearm of any kind. Period. Our firearms laws should make it harder, if not impossible, for people who hate to carry out their violent fantasies. And right now, our gun laws make it too damn easy for the haters to have guns. So where to begin? How about passing universal background checks, instituting violence restraining orders, raising the age of firearms purchases to 21, and banning 100-round drums, fixing our national instant criminal background check system, and investing in mental health inside our schools? These things cannot wait. I am so sick and tired of participating in this predictable cycle of politics where a mass shooting happens. The left calls for new gun laws, some meaningful, some unproductive. The right yells slippery slope and hides behind the Constitution. Nothing happens, nothing changes. And the next mass shooting, we do it all over again and again and again. I love the Constitution via its amendments. And I must disindoctrinate people in worshipping it as a religious relic. It is but a living, breathing document meant to be amended, meant to protect human beings and ensure their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What lives are we protecting when we arm a 21-year-old Confirmed white supremacist with 100 rounds of ammunition only so he can shoot up dozens of people at a Walmart, including the parents of a two-month-old infant. What liberty are we protecting if we don't feel safe at a mall or walking down the goddamn street? What happiness are we protecting if our children are afraid to go to fucking school? I know... I will be accused of letting my emotions get in the way of the facts here. I've made that accusation before myself. But this be an emotional issue. 
How could it not be? In fact, it should be more emotional. And to my blood enemies of the Republican Party, and especially the enemies of all humanity at the NRA, on the side of fucking gun rights, the guns have all the rights, but humans have none. If an idiot like you not be emotional about this, then join me, won't you? Emerge from your psychopathy and develop an EQ, an emotional quotient. There are people out there with low IQs. We used to call them idiots. And then there's people like you. If you're a Republican or especially a member of the NRA, who have low EQs or emotional quotes, you're emotionally retarded. You hurt only when you hurt yourself. All other person's pain is meaningless to a psychotic like you. So let's start with emotion. There's a lot we can accomplish if we start as humans. Not as NRA terrorists or firearms industrial lobbyists or even gun control lobbyists. Not as special interest groups or politicians, but humans. Moms and dads, brothers and sisters, friends and colleagues. Because we have everything to lose if we don't. And the Grand Republic of Texas be the leader in mass shootings. And why is the Republican governor silent? Greg Abbott's failure to respond to shootings like the one in Odessa be a moral disaster. Exactly how many dead Texans does it take for Governor Greg Abbott to actually do something about the epidemic of gun violence sweeping his state? So far, no body count is too big for Texas's governor, who all too obviously be determined to do exactly nothing. Texans love to swagger, brag, and boast that they be the biggest, the most, and the first. In the uniquely American horror story of mass shootings, they be closing in on all three, the biggest, the mostest, and the firstest. In every worst possible interpretation imaginable. With Saturday's mass murder in the West Texas city of Odessa, Texas has now had more casualties from major mass shootings than any state except Nevada. For years, some legislators have demanded that the governor of Texas lead the charge to pass new gun laws in the Lone Star State. He did, as Texas actually loosened restrictions on gun ownership with eight new laws, allowing guns everywhere, from schools to foster homes and churches and into the goddamn nurseries. Why don't you just take firearms and put them in the fucking cribs? Then you guys can blow your own brains out when you're born and leave the rest of us alone. And these laws... Put firearms everywhere, but up your ass. Took effect just hours after seven people were killed and at least 21 were wounded while shopping in Odessa, the oil and gas capital of Texas. The bloodshed in the city of 116,000 included three seriously wounded police officers and a toddler shot in the shoulder, her face sprayed with shrapnel, practically blown off. Yet no amount of violence has shamed Texas's Republican governor nor his right-wing lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, into any action whatsoever. In the wake of the El Paso massacre, which killed 22 and wounded 28 early yester Menzies, early last month of August, both of these white trash pieces of shit in public office, so-called public service, flew to that desert city of El Paso for a memorial. And in front of a scared, grieving crowd of thousands, Mr. Abbott offered up a gruel of pure shit. We still cannot comprehend the evil that struck El Paso. And the crowd, fully aware of the killer's ideological 
motivation of political hatred of Latinos. And his AK-47, supplied by the motherfucking Russians, responded with a leaden golf clap. After El Paso, it was discovered that the governor had made a fundraising appeal the day before that shooting, referencing immigrants, and I quote his T verbatim. He said, If we are going to defend Texas, defend Texas, we'll need to take its matters into our own hands. If we're going to defend Texas, we'll need to take matters into our own hands. Mr. Abbott's language like President Trump's, regurgitatively reflected the mass killer's racist online screed. As a matter of fact, they were quoting him. They parroted the very man who instigated, perpetrated massacre with genocidal intent. Unfortunately for Mr. Abbott, his letter was discovered just as he arrived in El Paso again to conduct one of his invitation-only roundtables about gun violence, all he's ever done despite the mounting body count. His contrition, when confronted with what he said about defending Texas from the Latino invasion, by taking matters into one's own hand, encouraging militia action in a military manner, by insinuating this was war. His contrition was verbalized as three words. Mistakes were made. And the mistake that was made was when your daddy didn't use a rubber, Mr. Abbott. And the best of your daddy's sperm ran down your mother's thigh. If leadership could be rated 1 to 10, Mr. Abbott's would be a zero. The names of dead, wounded, and shattered Texans on his watch are etched across the state. Dallas, Sutherland Springs, Santa Fe, El Paso, and now Odessa. He has never had the guts to do more than mouth a few platitudes while paying obeisance to the gun lobby in the state's admittedly historic gun culture. Circa 2015, he even tweeted, I'm embarrassed in all caps. Texas, number two in nation for new gun purchases behind California. All in caps. Let's pick up the pace, Texans. At NRA. That's how he signed off at NRA. Buy more guns, motherfuckers. In Austin, a group of about 20 legislators be demanding, quite fruitlessly, that the governor convene a special session to actually do, you know, fucking anything. As it meets only every other goddamn year, the legislature be adjourned. Till 20 fucking 21. One lawmaker, Democratic representative, Victoria Neve of Dallas, wrote the governor demanding a special session after the El Paso massacre. And she did so again after the Odessa killings. To quote as she, I think it's going to take courage for the governor to act and we cannot wait until 2021. The legislature has failed the people of Texas. Our governor has failed. More roundtables are not going to do the job. The harsh reality be that the odds are stacked against political courage in Austin. For one, Republicans and Democrats be both steeped in a deep gun culture. To quote is Scott Braddock, the dean of the Capitol Press Corps in Austin and the editor of the Quorum Report an independent political publication closely read in the corridors of power in Texas itself. He says, We have a gun culture that is not partisan. This legislature is the only one in the country where Democrats and Republicans both stop by talking about the Second Amendment. 
Matt Schaefer, a Republican who represents Tyler, Texas, in the legislature, even tweeted hours, but hours after the Odessa shooting, no to red flag per crime laws. No to red flag pre-crime laws. No to universal background checks. No to bans on AR-15s or high-capacity magazines. No to mandatory gun buybacks. He did add, however, yes to praying for victims. I mean, I guess it's the least you can fucking do. In the face of that, Mr. Abbott has effectively been mum. Meanwhile, his ostensible number two, Dan Patrick, the lieutenant governor who presided over the state senate, blamed violent video games after the El Paso shooting. He is also especially resistant to the one strong measure the governor once actually floated. Red flag laws for those who might be dangerous or mentally ill. That kind of courage just ain't their brand. Even as the Trump administration has turned Texas into a battleground of controversy, Mr. Abbott has made less noise than a frog in a draught. Not about the horrific conditions for immigrants incarcerated in Texas. Not about a border wall that is actually unpopular with most every fucking Texan resident in the Lone Star State. Not even about the uncertainty the president has injected into NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Association, and which in and of itself be vital to the economic lifeblood of Texas. If Mr. Abbott excels at anything, actually, it's disappearing. He is the most popular politician in the state, most certainly. He sits on a massive 26 million United States dollar war chest for his next campaign. Nobody has bothered to hint that they will even actually challenge him. Yet, Abbott definitely plays it safe, saying little, investing his political capital in nothing, making his leadership of the nation's second most populous state after my own golden California an absolute cipher. A kind of Texas Udini the governor be a great big disappearing act. James Henson, a University of Texas political scientist and pollster, has confirmed that if the governor wanted red flag laws, the legislature would be there. After all, when the governor would, has asked for less controversial laws, the legislature has passed them. All of them. Every single goddamn one. There certainly is enough public support. Over 60% of Texans want more rigorous background checks, according to the University of Texas' own polling. A plurality of Texans favor stricter gun laws. Only 40% want to ban semi-automatic weapons, admittedly, but Texans are split nearly evenly on banning their high-capacity magazines. At a Sunday news conference in Odessa, Mr. Abbott gamely tried to conceal his lack of action by noting, We've been meeting daily. Like a circle jerk, except nobody's popping off. You watch him jack off forever without the cum shot. Pressed on whether he would ban military-style weapons such as those deployed in Odessa, El Paso, and Sutherland Springs, the governor responded, Defensively, some of the shootings did not involve an AR. Yeah, one double-digit killing at a high school in Santa Fe. Incidentally, Mr. Abbott himself be a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, the state's flagship university. It was there on August 1st, 1966, while I was gestating in my late and sainted Cyrus's womb. While I was carried beneath the heart of my womb mother, Diana Dietrich, Takabayashi Hideko Sujin Lin. While I was preparing for my delivery within but months that year to first lay my eyes on this veil of tears. On the first day of the eighth month 
of the 1,966th year of our Lord, a former fucking Marine, a goddamn United States Marine Corps white trash piece of shit named Charles Whitman killed 17 teenagers and wounded 31 students and fathered the modern American mass shooting phenomenon. A proud accomplishment for a white trash Marine. This USMC piece of shit, Mr. Whitman's body count, be routinely matched by today's Texas mass shootings. And so long as Mr. Abbott lacks the moral courage to do something, anything, Texans are picking up the pace, Governor. Add NRA this, motherfucker, all the way up your goddamn ass. They're getting slaughtered. And the governor of Texas may as well be the Marine in the bell tower. Taking out the future. One bullet at a goddamn time. But sprayed. In a shower that hoses down. The hopes and dreams. Of people who would be paying taxes. To support the very politicians that promote their murder. God damn you, Abbott. God damn the Republicans. God damn anyone in Texas who sits complicit through inaction in this never-ending hurricane of blood and steel. Now, we've got another situation that could kill us all going on in the Amazon. Where the Amazon fires point the way for future international efforts to combat climate change. I've been trying to show the way forward on climate change. The situation in the Amazon exposes the very heart of the greatest collective action problem. The greatest global community challenge that humanity has ever faced. And it foreshadows harder battles yet to come. But threats worked in Brazil, and they might elsewhere as well. By now everyone with internet access be familiar with the grim situation unfolding in Brazil's Amazon rainforest. The ongoing blazes have been the source of widespread outrage over the policies and rhetoric of Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro. Several countries have offered aid, while also threatening punitive measures such as boycotts. Bolsonaro, in turn, has seized over the international community's colonial mindset, asserting Brazil's sovereignty over its territory and repeatedly issuing reminders of the historical deforestation of Europe. The situation in the Amazon exposes the very heart of the greatest collective action challenge that all humanity has ever faced in its evolutionary arc of development. And if we don't meet this challenge, humanity's not going to evolve any further because we're going to die in a mass extinction. And the next challengers on the evolutionary scale, will simply supersede us. The actions of each individual country have consequences for the global climate. Yet perpetrators be loath to make sacrifices when others, especially those with equal or greater responsibility, are not doing the same. The fact that threats of economic punishment seem to have shifted Brazil's behavior, Bolsonaro finally sent its military to fight the fires and agreed to a meeting of Amazon countries to be held Friday into the Labor Day weekend, suggested even then and suggests now that a similar approach could be taken to address climate change on a larger scale. The threat of sanctions. I would suggest, I would advise, military blockade. 
Now, although it be the dry season in Brazil, a time when fires in the Amazon be routine, many of the conflagrations scorching the rainforest be the result of farmers illegally expanding fields, doubtlessly emboldened by the words and actions of their Brazilian president. Since taking office in January, Bolsonaro has sought to systematically dismantle the environmental protections that had cut Brazil's deforestation rates by over 80% between 2004 and 2012, and that had contributed to its acclaim as a world leader in conservation, an ecological and environmental superpower. Bolsonaro's environmental minister, Ricardo Salas, denounced a proliferation of environmental fines that were ideological. And the Brazilian Institute of Environment and Renewable Natural Resources, known in the Portuguese acronym as IBAMA, not Obama, but spelled the same with an I in place of O, IBAMA imposed fewer deforestation fines in the first five months of 2019 than during the same period of any year in the last goddamn decade. The previous head of the agency resigned within a week of Bolsonaro's inauguration following attacks by the president himself. And in February, 21 of Obama's 27 state heads were all fired in a purge, a Stalinist bureaucratic massacre directly ordered by Bolsonaro. Meanwhile, a measure in Brazilian Congress, proposed by Bolsonaro himself, eliminated a deadline for unregistered rural properties to be entered into the Rural Environmental Registry, an important land use monitoring tool. And in part, thanks to the rolling back of enforcement, deforestation in July was 278% greater than last year, and the number of fires in the Amazon be 80% higher than at this point last year. It bears noting that fire rates were even higher for this than this now for most of the 2000s under President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva and that deforestation rates have been creeping back up since 2012 as Brazil's forest code and other environmental regulations were weakened under Bolsonaro's predecessors Dilma Rousseff and Mikhail Temer. Past deforestation and forest degradation have increased the likelihood of fires by creating dry debris, and many of this year's fires are merely clearing fields that were already deforested. But Bolsonaro's attitude warrants all the alarm, and his policies be doing undeniable harm to the Amazon at a time when it be approaching a tipping point, nearing a level of deforestation that could reduce its capacity to recycle moisture sufficiently and thereby trigger its conversion into savanna. In turn, the international community has welded both carrots and sticks to get Bolsonaro to step back into line. Carrots, such as aid, have been completely unsuccessful. In mid-August, Brazil's Ministry of the Environment said it would shutter a committee that allocates funding to deforestation projects and instead compensate farmers displaced by conservation areas even on illegally occupied land. Norway and Germany, the two largest contributors to the billion-dollar Amazon fund, which be dispersed through the committee, froze tens of millions of United States dollars of funding in response. But Bolsonaro told them to keep it. In fact, he told them to shove it, even suggesting that Deutsche Chancellor Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, use it to reforest Germany instead. Bolsonaro even initially declined the admittedly comparatively meager 20 million U.S. dollars offered by the G7 to fight the fires, later saying he would accept the aid under the condition that Brazil be allowed to choose how it be spent. And he was going to spend it, of course, on arming his police force to kill more indigenous peoples. All evidence suggests that offers of aid for conservation will not affect any of Bolsonaro's actions. Most aid goes to environmental groups, which Bolsonaro perceives as a threat to his economic development agenda, the livelihood of his rural supporters, 
and Brazil's sovereignty over the Amazon. In turn, countries have picked up the stick. Finland, for instance, proposed that the European Union ban imports of Brazilian beef, a move that would sting, as the European Union accounts for 11% of Brazil's beef export revenues. Indeed, such boycotts be a prospect that has long been openly feared by Brazilian agribusiness. Earlier this year, Agricultural Minister Teresa Cristina, concerned about international shunning of Brazilian products, successfully argued against Bolsonaro's plans to place the Ministry of Environment completely under the Ministry of Agriculture and withdraw the country from the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, days after Finland's gambit, Ireland and France threatened not to ratify the landmark trade deal between the European Union and the South American Mercosur trade bloc. Scrapping the agreement, which was touted as a potential gateway to future deals with Canada, South Korea, and other nations, would be a blow to Bolsonaro's free trade agenda. Now, later that very day, Within 24 fucking hours, Bolsonaro declared he would send the military to fight the fires. Economic threats, it be uh, quite evident, resonate deeply. President Sebastián Piñera of Chile took yet another track, acknowledging the need for both respect for territorial sovereignty and for the shared responsibility for the global climate. He and French President Emmanuel Macron announced a cooperation plan on reforestation between Amazon countries and the G7 to be presented at the United Nations General Assembly later this month. Bolsonaro agreed to attend the Friday meeting of leaders of Amazon countries in Colombia, although he then missed it to undergo surgery. He may have sent a representative in his place, but it be unclear what was proposed and whether Brazil's president would even support it. Bolsonaro will likely continue as to bristle at any and all attempts to regulate the Amazon, especially while the world's largest climate change contributors all remain unchecked. Deforestation in Brazil has enormous implications for climate change. But it be far from the only country not doing enough, nor the most significant. Indeed, the vast majority of global emissions originate from just a handful of other countries, including the Communist Chinese Empire and these United States. Chile, seeking to position itself as a coordinator of climate change efforts, will face a much more daunting challenge in December as the host of the 25th edition of the United Nations flagship meeting on climate change. Countries are due to ratchet up the climate commitments they agreed to meet by 2020, and specific agenda items such as final rules on carbon markets are to be addressed before then. Persuading nearly 200 countries to undertake a major transformation of their economies in order to meet the Paris target for limiting global warming will be exceedingly difficult. How countries hold each other to account thus be pivotal. The Paris Agreement lacks an enforcement mechanism, and that will not change in Chile. Countries will have to enforce the agreements themselves and perhaps find a way to stand up to the bigger powers. For all the fingers pointed at Brazil, it'd be telling that these United States, the American empire itself, has yet to pay any real price for its departure from the Paris Agreement under Donald Trump. Most countries cannot afford to sever economic ties with these United States, or the Communist Chinese Empire. But if the international community cannot find a way, through carrots or by sticks, to convince the Sino-American empires to drastically cut their emissions, economic ties will cease to matter. 
The apocalyptic clouds of smoke that darkened the afternoon skies of Sao Paulo in late August be a potent metaphor for the impending climatological catastrophe. Likewise, international outrage over the destruction of the Amazon be a microcosm of the climate emergency itself. Each country controls its own territory and has the ability to take its actions that its leaders believe is to be economically advantageous, even if they be environmentally destructive to the entire fucking planet. But if the key countries don't take action voluntarily... The international community must somehow transcend sovereignty to confront climate emergency. Hopefully, once the smoke is cleared, the fires in the Amazon will prompt a hard look in the mirror for us all. There must be a transnational entity, a supersessor to the United Nations, that will deploy military force to invade nations to force them to behave in a manner that betters our environment for future generations of all humanity, the human species itself. The American empire must evolve into a transnational empire, an entity that would serve that role. Now, I'll elucidate more on that in the future. For the moment, I will reflect upon a moment in history to start our arc of, our arc of narrative for the remainder of transmission. The year after I was born, 1967, saw the murder, the assassination, of Lam Bun. Circa 1967, Hong Kong witnessed protests considerably bloodier than the current political crises. When demonstrators, backed by the mainland, Communist China, attempted to seize control of the British Crown Colony and wrest it from the Empire. This was a blatant communist insurgency and invasion by riot armies. I was but months old at the time when a similar movement, a parallel insurgency in Macau, crossed the Bay of Hong Kong, had caused the Portuguese to give the Chinese Communist Party a major role in the city's governance. In Hong Kong itself, the British authorities fought back. Half a hundred and one people were killed by the communist insurgents' bombs or by the police in retaliation. Of the 51 people killed, one of the most significant victims was the radio journalist Lam Bun, a fiercely anti-communist commentator who was burned alive to death along with his cousin by a communist combat group, a communist red cell. Lamb's murder by immolation, by incineration, outraged Hong Kongers, and rightfully so. And in his being burned alive along with his cousin, he in particular became a symbol of free speech in the city of Hong Kong. The knife attack against a prominent editor, circa 2015, stirred memories of Lamb's murder. With Hong Kongers on edge about both the police and triad violence on the part of communist-contracted underworld gangs, Lam Boon's story remains uncomfortably resonant today. Now, we'll get back to Hong Kong and their victory. But while you were sleeping, the arms race escalated. 
Now, let me get some tea. Now, Pakistan announced on Thursday that it had successfully tested Gajnavi, a surface-to-surface ballistic missile. It declares can deliver multiple types of warheads up to 180 miles. The airspace around Pakistan's largest city, Karachi, was reportedly closed for several days during testing. Now, Donald Trump has repeatedly dismissed the recent testing of missiles by North Korea as a very standard activity. But now American intelligence officials and outside experts say North Korea show us signs of an advancing arsenal that could overwhelm all American defenses in region. Now off this planet, on our planetary partner, we are actually not a planet per se. The Earth-Moon system is actually a double planet. We are essentially a binary planet in astronomical terms. The moon essentially being our smaller twin. Now on the far side of the moon, communist China's discovery of a mysterious lunar gel during its Chang'e 4 mission probably isn't important in and of itself. The substance is likely to be the residue of asteroid impacts. But the fact that The Communist Chinese Empire, and not these United States, has produced such discoveries lately. Is disturbing analysts in Washington, where Donald Trump himself is still pushing for a space force, a new and independent military arm. Now, that's basically, as far as I'm concerned, movie plot material. And in the Communist Chinese Empire, they've produced a summer blockbuster. This summer has seen uh, one of the rarest of uh, phenomenon, a good film produced by the mainstream Chinese studio system. Uh, That's not fair to say, but the animated hit entitled Ni Jia, spelled any space G-H-A in the romanization from the Putong Wa Guoye, the Chinese language, is a blockbuster about a child god famous for fighting monsters, a figure once so key to Chinese religion that the capital Beijing was built after a model of his body. You can look up Neijia. Again, that's spelled N-E space Z-H-A on YouTube and find trailers. The recent movie comest 40 years after a classic adaption of the myth. The 2019 version of Nija has earned more than 656 million United States dollars at the box office in Communist China itself. I do recommend it for review by people here in the American Empire or anywhere in the world. Now, fentanyl has surpassed heroin and prescription pills to become as the leading driver of the opioid crisis and is now the top cause of American overdose deaths. Today, officials say the majority be smuggled from Mexico. Now, Donald Trump himself says they come from communist China. And the Communist Chinese Empire has responded by declaring Donald Trump's claims about fentanyl origin to be false. China stated officially Tuesday of last week that it's not the source of fentanyl that's killing Americans. Contrary to President Donald Trump's recent tweets blaming China for the drug deaths. At a briefing for the National Narcotics Control Commission, China reiterated that it be making extensive efforts toward controlling the synthetic opioid and should not be labeled the main origin of fentanyl to these United States.
The drug off comes through the mail or across the Mexico border. It could be stronger and more lethal than heroin and be responsible for tens of thousands of American drugs deaths each year. Now, amid the latest round of tariff increases between the two empires, yestermensies, last month, Trump blasted China in a Twitter thread in which he vowed to order all postal carriers to, he wrote this all in uppercase, search for and refuse all deliveries of fentanyl for China or anywhere else. That was in parentheses. Trump added, referring to the communist Chinese dictator, Xi Jinping, President Xi said this would stop. It didn't. Now, Liu Weijin, the Narcotics Commission's vice commissioner, told reporters on Tuesday last week, what Trump said is completely groundless and untrue. Now, in a sweeping change in May, uh, the month of the rest of the world's Labor Day, outside of Canada, for some reason, I, I has to dial. It's got to do with the churches. I'll get into that at some point in the future. <laughs> but um, on everyone else's Labor Day in May, you know, all the socialist people of the world, that day, Communist China began this year regulating all fentanyl-related drugs as a class of controlled substance with the aim of curbing illegal drug trafficking. No fentanyl smuggling cases have been discovered between the United States and the Communist Chinese Empire since the new measures were implemented, uh, according to Vice Commissioner Liu. Now, he's in the position my own relation Commissioner Lin was in, back in the days of Communist China's Opium War, when they were suffering what we're going through now. And, of course, law enforcement officials in Virginia attested last week that Communist China was linked to a seizure of enough cheap fentanyl to kill 14 million people. One of the 39 people charged in the multi-state drug ring be accused of ordering fentanyl from a vendor in Shanghai. This, of course, would be the primary reason for the new economic zones in communist China. Now, let me try to put this into some perspective so that uh, people understand what I'm talking about. When it comes to uh, communist China, what they have going down is uh, a kind of uh, special activity zone that uh, will allow the economy to uh, attract investment. And so this is one of those things that uh, has long been what the Soviet Union originally intended. The communist Chinese uh, picked it up from them. This kind of concept in which they hope to make um, major Chinese cities uh, brand new Hong Kong by getting foreigners to invest as uh, much as possible. Now, all of this is pathetic at this point in history because of the, how do I say it, the trade war. It's made all of this a moot point. So more than anything else, it's really just fucking sad. I'm actually somewhat depressed by this effort. And I can only hope that this is not what it's turning out to look like. Where we've got a situation 
where instead of communist China enriching itself, these are now points of agris for drugs into the United States. A true form of narcotic assault. So, with that in mind, we are entering very frightening times of a Cold War in which potentially millions of people will die due to the kind of assaults exchanged across the Pacific using insurgency and weaponized narcotics. So these are indeed frightening times. I feel no envy for any parent attempting to raise a child in this world today. What they're going to grow up facing is nothing easy when it comes to where we're headed. So, I'm going to take just a little kind of break here. I'm not leaving. I'm uh, just going to try and check the chat room. Uh, I can't resist. Definitely just want to kind of take a look at uh, what people are saying and um, then get back into the arc of narrative. But when it comes to, uh, you know, what we're talking about, we're going to get pretty hot and heavy into Sino-American trade, the trade war, that's unavoidable in a situation like this, uh, where, of course, I try to uh, keep track of just how far this can go in terms of hostilities. And I'm happy to say that I'm taking a look at uh, people entering their comments, and I'm immediately hit with Lena Crane uh, sharing with us that uh, fentanyl killed her niece's father. May he rest in eternal peace. I'm so sorry, honey. God bless you and all your family. I'm so sorry that he was in such pain that he put an end to it with that. Now, definitely... Taking a look at what other people are saying here. Uh, G State says, Do you think in declaring the NRA a terrorist organization in San Francisco that having a bumper sticker or a hat with a logo will be probable cause for being detained? I would hope so. Yes, I would definitely encourage that. And uh, it's something that uh, is definitely necessary uh, in order to get the message across that these people are simply not welcome in our world. Uh, they have nothing to offer uh, other than pain and suffering and more death. Uh, they're like human fentanyl, and uh, except without the killing of the pain, they're just uh, causing it. So they're all, uh, uh, as I said, um, truly terrorists and um, should be should be persecuted as such. There's no other word for it. And if possible, prosecute it. Now, in terms of uh, going back to the Cold War, now that I've checked into the chat room, something that I've never done before while broadcasting, uh, you know, certainly not in the manner that I have just now with intent to, you know, go over what people are saying. The United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, G. Zachary Terwilliger at a news conference attested that the illicit fentanyl that's coming in, the vast majority is from China, and a lot of it is coming in through the mails. Now, Liu noted Tuesday 
that the American fentanyl deaths continue to rise despite increasingly strict controls on the Chinese side, which he said, or asserted, was an indication that the drugs were not coming from China. And Liu also accused a few politicians in these United States of misleading the American public on communist China's work to help the United States with its opioid crisis. Now, Chinese and American authorities are presumably working together to handle drug crimes. And uh, the Vice Commissioner Liu added that cooperation on fentanyl has no bearing on ongoing trade negotiations between the two empires. Trump himself complaining about China's alleged inaction on fentanyl as part of a four-tweet thread last month accusing communist China of stealing United States intellectual property and ordering American companies to immediately start looking for an alternative to communist China. So we had that going down, which again I'm going to address as I continue to uh, ah, analyze to the best of my ability the situation. Now, in communist China, they have a phenomenon for social, how would I say it, uh, for lack of a better word, socialization. Uh, in, in, uh, that doesn't do it justice at all. Uh, I would call it kind of like um, uh, social homogenization called the social credit system. It has nothing to do with anything like social security. These are like merits and demerits earned by behavior to modify mass behavior. Now, the European Union Chamber of Commerce in Communist China has issued a new report evaluating the Communist Chinese government's employment of social credit to keep private companies in line. The account reflects the real use of social credit in contrast to potentially overblown claims such as those seen in the cult TV show entitled Black Mirror. Now, the social credit system's initial rollout, at least, is supposed to substitute for the dire absence of commercial trust. But as Chinese Communist Party cells of ideological cadres, political officers, become ever more integrated into the corporate hierarchy, the data will undoubtedly be used to tighten the party's grip on the private sector as well. Now, at the top of all of this, be Xi Jinping. Early signs show us that communist dictator Xi Jinping is more powerful than ever in the run-up to the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China in October. Communist Chinese state media has officially labeled the party chairman as the People's Leader, a title last used regularly by the genocidal Mao Zedong, who did not leave this earth until he had put into the ground, mostly in shallow mass graves, a hundred million people before himself. While there's been a lot of talk about opposition to Xi Jinping, particularly among wealthy Chinese or those outside the Communist Chinese Empire. Those within the Chinese Communist Party have no real ability to act against the dictator Xi Jinping at all. And he himself delivered a fierce speech just the other day. A combative speech was delivered by Communist Chinese dictator Xi Jinping at a Communist Party training school published in state media Tuesday of last week, reiterating the idea 
that the communist Chinese empire be locked in a global struggle, as usual, sans any specific foe. Kind of like the British with their Brexit, even though everyone knows Britain is at war with Germany. Now, Xi Jinping emphasized the dominance of the Chinese Communist Party and that anything damaging it would, in turn, damage the Chinese Empire. Now, there's something he said that bears relating that has not been translated into the English, in which he declared that English, as a language, is actually Chinese. This was based on a group of academics in communist China having claimed that English and other European languages are actually descended from Old Chinese and that European history was faked to conceal its Chinese origins. Now, this source is from the state-sponsored academic organization known as Xiejie Wenming Yanju Ku Jianyu or the World Civilization Research Association. Now, the World Civilization Research is the Research Association professors, doctors, and academics believest the English language to actually be a Chinese intellectual property and that all European history prior to the 15th century be entirely faked. In other words, Xi Jie Wenming Yanju Ku Jinwi scholars are claiming that Western civilization originates from China and all European languages are merely Putong Wa Guoye or Mandarin Chinese linguistic dialects. During an interview with Sina Online, World Civilization Research Association Vice President and Secretary General Jai Guiyun said that some English words obviously derive from Putong Wa Guoye or the national language of the mandarins. Exemply Gracia. Yellow resembles the national mandarin language term for falling leaf, which in the Chinese is ye luo, which they say uh, became yellow uh, because, you know, autumnal leaves following are yellowed the color of autumn, whereas the word heart resembles the Chinese word hedie, or core, as in heartland, or core region. Now, Dr. Jai concluded this proves the English language be, in fact, not but a dialect of putong wa guoyi, the national language of the Mandarins, Mandarin Chinese. And he has further claimed that after Chinese formed the English language, Russian, French, German, and other European-based languages went through a similar process of sinicization. The World Civilization Research Association group of scholars be professors from a number of Chinese academic institutions. Association member Zhu Zhuanxi further asserted that all Western civilization be but a sub-civilization of Zhonghua Ren, or Chinese culture. He said Europeans felt ashamed due to the fact that there was no history in Europe before the 15th century compared to China, and in an attempt to paper over this historical humiliation, the Europeans fabricated stories about ancient Egyptian 
Hellenic Greek, and classical Roman civilizations, all based on Chinese history. World Civilization Research Association founder Du Gangjian said the organization has set up branches in these United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Thailand, South Korea, and Melagasia, or Madagascar, the island thereof, to restore the truth of world history. And he'd be quoted as saying, I'll just translate it into the English for you, do not let fake Western-centered history, Westocentric would be the literary translation, hinder the great Sino-Renaissance, uh, the great rebirth of, of Zhonghua, China. Now, many Zhonghua Ren or Chinese citizens themselves be unconvinced, however, with some mocking the association members by calling them wolf warrior scholars with references to a patriotic communist Chinese movie that I actually linked for review upon my Facebook timeline uh, prior to my being deplatformed. And uh, this is, of course, uh, what you can review if you look up on YouTube or do searches on the Google or other search engines for Wolf Warrior 2. Uh, There's a Wolf Warrior 1, but number 2 is the one I saw that many people felt was very relevant to my own experience. Uh, Having fought in Africa, uh, having been dishonorably discharged, the main character of that film is dishonorably discharged and winds up in Africa. And uh, so it, it does bear watching. It is an excellent film. Now, one commentator has sardonically lamented about this you know, world resource organization in China, that, thanks, he said, now we can no longer laugh at the Koreans who claimed Confucius and Genghis Khan are both Korean. Now, this controversial theory that I've just related to you, uh, regurgitated or parroted in this uh, challenging speech, literally a challenge, by the communist Chinese dictator Xi Jinping, as delivered by him, The controversial theory might seem otherwise inconsequential, but since it's being propagated by the dictator of the communist Chinese empire himself, we ignore this at our peril. Watch for people taking advantage of the new ethno-nationalism to push more claims like this, and to get communist Chinese state funding for it, too. Now, This is the communist Chinese version of that stupid Russian bullshit about there being no dark ages. The Fomenko theory, or whatever that shit is. Mm. And I believe I remember it correctly. Matter of fact, let me try and look it up so that um, I can sicken myself. Ah, yes, the new chronology. Anatoly Fomenko, the Russian-Soviet mathematician. Anatoly Timofeyevich Fomenko, a Soviet and Russian mathematician, a professor at Moscow University, well known as a topologist and a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, be the author of a pseudoscientific theory known as New Chronology. Now, unfortunately, this piece of shit is also a member of the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences. Unfortunately, he's still alive at 74 years of age, promoting bullshit, and um, he is saying the Dark Ages never existed, that history is all a fake, And, uh, in fact, ancient Rome, Greece, and Egypt, as we know them, didn't exist at all. So, there we have that. It's maddening to deal with this level of insanity in the academic world based on identity politics and the erasure of all other identities. People like this, 
they just need to die. And that, of course, brings us to Trump's trade tantrum tariffs. There'd be no end in sight to the Sino-American trade war. As Beijing's failure to capitulate to American President Donald Trump's demands reportedly caused a stormy tantrum in which he threatened to double tariffs. It being reported that President Donald Trump had to be talked down from doubling his tariffs on Chinese goods after he reacted furiously to Communist China's retaliation against said tariffs. Treasury Secretary Stephen Nukin and United States Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer evidently got a bunch of chief executive officers, CEOs, to call the president and tell him why such a move would be a very bad idea for the economy worldwide, not just America. Chinese trade negotiators may be in Washington later this month, but progress remains unlikely. Just take a look at factory activity. Because meanwhile, the numbers show that American manufacturing activity is hurting. And the numbers suggest a rising trade imbalance. Based on an Institute for Supply Management Index, the United States manufacturing sector shrank last month. Yesterday, says in August, the first time it has done so in three years. Almost entirely thanks to the goddamn trade war. This news knocked stocks and government bond yields. Now, to escape all this, we watch films, and that reminds me of the Netflix production released this year, American Factory. Now, this Netflix documentary, backed by former United States President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama's production company, depicts a communist Chinese-run glass factory in the state of Ohio, it being a skillful rendition of culture clash and common humanity. But it has also prompted online discussion in the communist Chinese empire itself, even though it's not available in country, Red China. Some commentators are proud of the reversal of fortunes, American laborers working for Chinese managers, but others have noted that American workers enjoy rights that Chinese ones lack entirely. Now, in terms of another Western economy in the Pacific, we've got poor economic results down under. Australia's economy slowed, with just half a percentage of gross domestic product growth this quarter, the country's weakest since the financial crisis. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the numbers, which were slightly better than predicted, were a repudiation to all those who sought to talk it down. This while the communist Chinese monolithic superstate, the giant astride the Pacific, are attempting to straddle it, be undergoing its own endurance test. Economists say China should beef up domestic consumption and production and diversify supply chains beyond these United States to fortify its economy against the trade war. They note that the domestic consumption and investment contribute more to growth than foreign exports. And a Deutsche Bank report said as much as 80% of communist China's exports went to countries other than these United States. So the ANZ, the ANZ, the Australia and New Zealand Banking Group, an Australian multinational banking and uh, financial services company headquartered in Melbourne, Australia, and the second largest bank by assets and third largest bank by market capitalization in Australia, called the trade war's impact on communist China's growth, quote unquote, overrated. Now... Let's qualify this with the usual caveat. It's much harder to feel China's economic pain 
because the data be far less open. Meanwhile, a raft of new tariffs on communist Chinese goods entering these United States will make rising prices more visible to ordinary Americans. So the question be, will Trump back down as his trade war with the communist Chinese empire bites us back in the ass here in the economy of these United States? Now, okay, we're still sending loud and clear, as confirmed by my technical advisor, Mr. Brendan. And uh, with that question being asked, if there was any lingering doubt that Donald Trump's trade war with the Communist Chinese Empire is exerting a considerable cost on the American economy, it was all erased Tuesday last week when a closely watched statistic indicated that factory output dropped in August. The news confirmed other recent suggestions that the manufacturing sector has entered recession. Now, that doesn't mean the overall economy is slumping. Not yet, anyway. These days, manufacturing is dwarfed by the enormous service sector, which includes industries like healthcare, financing, and retailing. But it's still a key part of the economy and it plays an outsized role in Trump country, particularly the Midwest. Now, during the 2016 campaign, Donald Trump promised to restore manufacturing to its former glory. And during the first two years of his presidency, he boasted frequently about how well it was going. On Tuesday, he didn't comment on the new report, which coincided with another drop on Wall Street. Last week, stock prices rose as traders seized upon hopeful statements from United States and Communist Chinese officials about restarting the stalled trade talks. Now the reality of the situation has set in. And this past Sunday, but the day before yesterday or so, A raft of new tariffs on Chinese goods entering these United States went into effect. So too did some new duties on American goods entering Communist China, which Beijing imposed as a retaliatory maneuver. Now, unlike the original Trump tariffs, which were levied mainly on intermediate products made in China, such as parts for computers and automobiles, the new levies of 15% apply to many consumer goods, including clothes and sports equipment. That means their effects, higher prices, will be more visible to ordinary Americans. Now, as recently as March, Trump claimed that trade wars are good and easy to win. That statement ignored history and the business environment facing American manufacturing companies. Many American businesses facing a steep price hike for the Chinese manufactured components they rely on to assemble finished products, were forced to try to source from other countries. Meanwhile, the entire manufacturing sector was faced with rising uncertainty about when or whether the trade war would be resolved. With Trump issuing dire threats one moment and making nice with Xi Jinping the next, It was hard for anyone to figure out how things would play out. The net results of all of this were cuts in production and postponements to capital investments. Back in April, just one month after Trump issued his idle boast, the manufacturing index maintained by the Institute for Supply Management, a nonprofit trade group, started to drop. Tuesday's announcement confirmed that the index which be based on a survey of purchasing managers at large and small firms, slid again in August. That means it has fallen for five months in a fucking row. And the chain of causation is not in dispute. For respondents to the monthly ISM survey, Institute of Supply Management survey, 
When it comes to lost manufacturing power, trade remains the most significant issue. As confirmed by Timothy Fiore, uh, maybe a relation of Yvonne, shout out to she, who compiles said index, which he related on National Public Radio the second day of last week, second day of last work week, Tuesday. Now, in spite of Trump's bluster, he be looking more and more boxed in. All along, his thinking has been that export-dependent communist China simply couldn't withstand a lengthy trade war with its largest trading partner. But the government in Beijing has held firm, despite a sharp slowdown in the Chinese economy. Rather than acceding to Trump's demands for expensive and extensive changes in how it organizes its economy and treats American firms, Communist China has responded to each of Trump's escalations with retaliatory measures in turn. And on Sunday, the Communist Chinese government filed a complaint over Trump's latest tariffs with the WTO, the World Trade Organization, that intergovernmental ruling body that China joined circa 2001. Now, in a statement... The Chinese Ministry of Commerce said that Communist China would firmly safeguard its legitimate rights and interests and firmly defend the multilateral trading system and international trade order in accordance with relevant WTO rules. Now, with the Communist Party of China gearing up for a big celebration at the start of next month, marking the 70th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic, it seems unlikely that Chinese trade negotiators will make any big concessions during the next few weeks. But will Donald Trump instead do so? Because unlike Xi Jinping and other communist Chinese leaders, Trump has an election to worry about. The conflicting signals he sent during August, the crazy month that I'll just have to get into in terms of what details I recall about Trump's behavior, wherein yestermensies, or last month, Trump escalated his tariff threats and then talked up the possibility of resolution after the Dow dived, demonstrated that he be at least intermittently aware of the political constraints he faces. As part of Trump's strategy of escalation, he has threatened to further expand his tariffs on October 1st and December 15th. If these changes went into effect, virtually all imports from Communist China would be facing some sort of levy, and the average rate would be 24.3%, according to Chad Brown, of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. China would retaliate again, and entering an election year, Trump would be in an all-out trade war. It can only be guessed how the stock market would react to this prospect. Despite the prospect of more interest rates cuts from the Federal Reserve, it may be ugly. The alternative could be for Donald Trump to accept some sort of a face-saving deal in which Communist China agreed to increase its imports of American goods, particularly agricultural products, and the United States agreed to roll back some of its tariffs and ease the restrictions it has imposed on Huawei, the Chinese flagship technologies company. Such a deal would involve the Trump administration setting aside at least for now, its demands for structural changes to communist China's model of state-led capitalism. But it might calm the nerves of investors and help prevent the troubles of the manufacturing sector from spreading over into the broader economy. Overall spending by consumers has held up pretty well so far, but a report released on Friday into the Labor Day weekend 
Confirmed consumer confidence. Taking a dive. Come August. Now, yesterday, Tariff Man, that's Donald Trump, was back in Twitter attack mode, warning the Communist Chinese Empire not to try and wait out at his administration, saying that the terms of a deal in his second term would be MUCH TOUGHER, all in caps. China's supply chain, Trump asserted, would crumble in the meantime. Well, words are fucking cheap. In fact, they're fucking free. Over the next few weeks, Trump's actions will be the thing to watch. Now what he says. And that brings us to the Trump ally, or back to the Trump ally, who be al- who's allowing the Amazon to burn. Because I've spoken of big business... I've spoken of the environment. And we cannot escape these subjects, either business or the environment. They constitute the two major components of our world as a social entity. Now, as a natural entity, as fires have surged in the Amazon, the Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro's disdain for all environmental protection measures, has drawn international attention, and rightly so. Back in January of 2012, when many people thought the Mayans had predicted the end of the world, Jair Bolsonaro, who was then a retired military officer and a colorful but not politically relevant far-right congressman, was caught fishing illegally in a federally protected Marine Wildlife Reserve. Now, Bolsonaro, at that time wearing a white Speedo-like bathing suit and looking every bit like um, some kind of faggot hustler or something, was discovered in a small inflatable boat, uh, kind of like a, 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 a pool toy, <laughs> inside the Tamoy's Ecological Station or Tamoios. It's an area with a half-mile radius that serviced as refuge for penguins, seals, whales, and dolphins in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Now, an agent with the Brazilian Institute of Environment and Renewable Natural Resources, acronymous in the Portuguese as IBAMA, which I've articulated earlier, issued Bolsonaro a ticket for 10,000 reais, or roughly $2,500, 2500 which you would think is, ooh, that's pretty steep. But the following year, Bolsonaro introduced a bill in the legislature that would have barred guards with Obama and other environmental agencies from even carrying guns. And although Bolsonaro himself was otherwise a longtime defender of gun ownership rights in Brazil, he wanted to make sure none of these men and women, these courageous agents of that agency, would be ever able to defend themselves from his assassins. Now, later that year, Bolsonaro filed to get legal permission for him and him alone. Bolsonaro, as an individual, terminally unique to fish in the Tamoyas Reserve. I mean, what could ever be perceived as more corrupt than that? Ultimately, the fine against Bolsonaro was dismissed. His bill, that he would be given sole terminally unique privilege as an individual to fish the Tamoyas went nowhere in Congress and the courts decided it would be a bad idea to grant one single lawmaker special permission to fish in a environmental sanctuary recognized by all the world. 
Now, last year, Bolsonaro was elected the president of Brazil. After running a nationalist campaign, a neo-nationalistic campaign, that echoed in oh so many ways the politics of Donald John Trump who he has modeled himself after. A climate change skeptic himself, Bolsonaro argued that more land in the Amazon rainforest should be open for farming, mining, and logging. As a matter of fact, he promised to completely deforest the Amazon and turn all Brazil into a giant fucking parking lot we shop in malls from end to end. And under his leadership, Obama's budget has been cut by a quarter of a hundred percent, 24 percent. Bolsonaro has also repeatedly threatened to transform the Tamoios Reserve into a Brazilian Cancun, brimming with tourist hotels. The agent who wrote him the ticket for illegal fishing back in 2012 was fired from a senior governmental position. And Bolsonaro has instead installed opponents of environmental regulations in offices throughout his new administration. He, like Mao Zedong, has vowed to wage war against all nature until nature no longer exists. In the case of Mao Zedong, this resulted in the great famine of communist China and ultimately, along with all his other genocidal actions, left a hundred million people dead in the ground before Mao himself followed them into eternity. With Bolsonaro, we can only predict the same will happen proportionate to Brazil's own population. And that he will go down in history for his mass murder of his own population to be remembered forever as an agent of terror and destruction. May his soul burn in hell forever. Damn him to annihilation. Now, I've said before what the solution to a madman like this is. It cannot be overemphasized when this week Bolsonaro's disdain for environmental protection measures attracted global attention as he initially rejected an offer of 20 million United States dollars in international aid to help fight forest fires burning in the Amazon. The proposed funding was one of the few concrete achievements to come out of the annual G7 summit of the world's largest democracies. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, who hosted the meeting in the resort town of Biarritz, insisted that countering the fires should be a top priority. At first, Bolsonaro rejected the aid offer citing an ongoing feud with Macron, in which the two leaders have exchanged insults. Then Bolsonaro said that he would consider accepting the aid if Macron publicly apologized. Bolsonaro even went so far as to say, Macron will have to withdraw his words, and then we can talk. This, while scientists conclude that the Amazon's absorption of greenhouse glasses plays a crucial role in slowing climate change. 
Scientists have declared the spread of fires in the world's largest rainforest be a global catastrophe, a crisis that impacts us all. As the green lung of planet Earth shrinks and the forest disappears, the region be growing progressively drier. And scientists forewarn that the Amazon could reach a tipping point where its gradual transformation into something closer to an arid stepland or brush desert will be irreversible. Bolsonaro has dismissed environmental groups' concerns and encouraged loggers to deforest ever more of the Amazon. On August 10th, in what became known as Fire Day, Farmers in the town of Novo Progresso, in the state of Piare, set fires on their properties to clear land and show their support for Bolsonaro. Satellites operated by Brazil's space agency detected a surge of wildfires. Now the blazes be so widespread that a fortnight are gone. Of what we need are two weeks, 14 nights ago. Smoke darkened the skies over Sao Paulo, thousands of miles to the south. Now, based on satellite data, space agency officials estimate that the number of forest fires be 83% larger than last year. Bolsonaro has dismissed these numbers as fake, calling environmentalists' focus on the Amazon a form of environmental psychosis. And he fired the head of the space agency. The Brazilian president also claimed that environmental non-governmental organizations had set the fires to damage the image of his government. Bolsonaro and his cabinet have rolled back all environmental regulations across Brazil. His minister of agriculture, livestock and food supply is a former congresswoman known as the Queen of Poison a reference to her effort to lift all restrictions on the use of deadly pesticides. Since Bolsonaro took office in January, the Agriculture Ministry has approved hundreds of new pesticide products, all of which have been banned by every other nation on earth and declared weapons of mass destruction. In other words, what other world leaders like Saddam Hussein would have deployed as a chemical weapon against their enemies, Bolsonaro now be deploying against the native indigenous aboriginal populations of his own nation in Brazil. When Saddam Hussein massacred the Kurds with chemical weapons, the world decided to invade. When Assar al bashad massacred his own people in Syria with chemical weapons, the world threatened to invade. Now, When the Ministress of Agriculture, Livestock, and Food Supply in Brazil, the Queen of Poison herself, launches chemical attacks to eradicate all life in the Emerald Forest, we all sit back impotently and weep. The new head of the Brazilian Forest Service supports allowing jaguars and other endangered species to be hunted to extinction in the rainforest. People have since killed jaguars by the hundreds and brought in their pelts for Bolsonaro's tailors to convert into fur clothing for his family. For Bolsonaro's environmental policies are, Bolsonaro chose an ally of agribusiness named Ricardo Salas, 
who had been sued when he served as the state environment secretary for Sao Paulo for altering the borders of an environmentally protected area with the clear intention of benefiting economic sectors, notably mining. After Salas was criticized by environmental organizations, Bolsonaro declared, We got it right! Obama agents have reported being met with increasingly violent responses from miners and forestry workers as they perform their environmental protection duties. No longer armed to protect themselves, when officials from said agency destroyed equipment used in environmental crime in the Amazon, as per regulations, Bolsonaro criticized them, saying that the government fine industry should be shut down. Declaring that the bureaucratic agency issuing fines in punishment was an industry all its own. To be destroyed as if he were busting a monopoly. In October yesteryear, inspectors were stopped halfway across a bridge in an indigenous reserve in the northern state of Rondonia by a group of loggers carrying machetes and sticks. One inspector reported that one of the lockers said, Now that Bolsonaro has won, this indigenous land nonsense is over. We will kill them all, and it'll all be ours. In the state of Pare, individuals with links to illegal logging burned down two bridges on the Trans-Amazonian Highway in retaliation for a crackdown by Obama in area, so that no one could send in reinforcements or agents to rescue the indigenous families as they massacred them. Since Bolsonaro took office, the Obama agency has carried out no major operations to slow deforestation, and the number of fines imposed by same agency has sunk to its lowest level since 1995. On the eve of the G7 summit, Emmanuel Macron called the fires an ecocide, a mass murder of nature itself, and threatened to block the free trade deal between the European Union and Mercosur, the trade bloc consisting of Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Bolsonaro responded by endorsing a post on Facebook that said that the French First Lady, Brigitte Macron, was physically unattractive. Recent opinion polls have shown a decline in public support for Bolsonaro as the country's economy has been slow to recover from deep recession and scandals have beset his government, which consists entirely of his relations and his cronies. A mafia. Bolsonaro, however, continues to have one strong supporter. On Tuesday last week, Donald Trump tweeted, Bolsonaro is working very hard on the Amazon fires and in all respects doing a great job for the people of Brazil. Not easy. He and his country have the full and complete support of the United States of America. And that brings us to Trump's wacky, angry, the extremophile August. President Trump defended Russian President Vladimir Putin at the G7 conference, one of the many ways he has behaved in recent weeks like a man entirely out of control. Indeed, the 31 days of August, this 2019th year of our Lord, offered an extraordinary catalog of President Trump's public meltdown. And President Trump Ended August as he began it with a blast of angry tweets, ad hominem insults, and bizarre fulminations that have become so standard that they no longer receive the attention they deserve, emanating as they do from the world's most powerful leader. In between retweeting hurricane preparation warnings, Trump spent the final day of the month attacking the disgusting and foul-mouthed Omarosa Manigault, his former advisor, who wrote a tell-all book about her short time in the administration, 
entitled The Cricket Cop. Uh, James Comey, of course, uh, bearing that title in Trump's eyes. The former FBI director, whom he fired. And the quote-unquote even dumber former CIA director, John Brennan. All of these individuals being the subjects of Trump ire. Trump himself bragging about low Labor Day gas prices, although they were actually lower on the Labor Day before he became president. Trump congratulating his friend Sean Hannity for the ratings on his Fox News shoe, as our man, um, I can't even remember the guy's name who used to say that term. Tonight we have a really big shoe. This was in the days of my late and sainted sire, George Joseph Henry Dietrich. Um, oh my God, I, I can't remember that guy's name. But Donald Trump is aping him uh, and thereby dating his age. Now, but 24 hours earlier, Trump had tweeted what appeared to be a classified image from his intelligence briefing of a catastrophic accident at an Iranian missile launch site. A presidential leak of secret information on social media that would have been, needless to say, utterly unthinkable in any other presidency. All of this taking place when Trump was supposed to be in Poland for a somber commemoration of the beginning of the Second World War in Europe. Trump canceled the trip, however, citing the need to monitor the progress of Hurricane Dorian, which was threatening Florida. Instead, Trump watched Fox News, tweeted nearly two dozen times before noon on Saturday, August 31st, and then motorcaded to a Trump-branded golf course for his 226th day on the links at one of his own properties, since becoming fucking president. Now that's the tank I've that that statistic I've just related to you. Sourced from Kyle Griffin, an MSNBC producer who keeps track of this particular niche Trump metric. His golfing. And the Poland trip wasn't even the first foreign visit that Trump canceled last month. Trump was supposed to have gone to Denmark earlier in August, but he refused in a fit of pique after the Danish government mocked his efforts to buy Greenland, which, of course, another Oval Office antic that had it occurred a few years ago, no one would have believed. Trump not only makes us believe it now, but as we approach the three-year mark of his upset victory, circa 2016, his project has succeeded in such a confounding way that it seems as though Americans will now believe anything. And nothing at all. Today, there'd be few things too extreme not to have plausibly come out of the mouth or the Twitter feed of the 45th president. In August, Trump called himself the chosen one for his confrontation with the communist Chinese empire, grinning and flashing a thumbs up during a photo op with the family of mass shooting victims while accusing Jews who voted for Democrats of great disloyalty and calling the chairman of the Federal Reserve an enemy of these United States. Trump cheered the robbery of a Democratic congressman's home and labeled various critics nasty and wrong, pathetic, highly unstable, wacko, psycho, and lunatic, among other insults that rightly describe himself to speak of projection. The daily stream of invective was dizzying to keep track of, and so voluminous as to almost ensure that no one, in fact, could even do so. The Trumpian extremes on display in the 3rd August of his presidency revived a debate about whether he'd be descending into even less presidential behavior shedding the remaining constraints imposed upon him by his office and the efforts of his ever-changing staff. If it seems as if Trump is is wackier 
angrier, more willing to lash out, and more desperately seeking attention than ever before. That is because he is. This at least be my conclusion. After reviewing Trump's Twitter feed from the past month, along with his public statements, remarks to the press, speeches, and rallies. To revisit a month in the life of this president was exhausting. A dark journey to a nasty and contentious sewer of shit. A dive into the cistern. And while Trump's performance raised many questions that we can't answer about just what is going on in his head, it was also revelatory. The 31 days of August, this 2019 year of our Lord, turn out to be an extraordinary catalog of Trump's in-our-faces meltdown. At first, I myself wasn't sure that anything about Trump's frenetic August was really all that different. There had been many previous months of dysfunction. Trump has always courted controversy and trafficked in insults. But then I looked at August 2017, during the first summer of his presidency, which was one of the more shocking months of his early tenure. Back then, Trump warned of fire and fury against North Korea, and spracketh of good people on both sides of the white supremacist march in Charlottesville that culminating in the sacrificial killing of a peaceful counter-protester, Heather Heyer, a breeding-age white woman, sacrificed to the anti-gods. And yet the Trump of two years ago was different, well, to a degree. He was provocative and insulting and fact-challenged, of course, but to a much lesser extent than he be today. Then and now, he was boastful and braggadocious. He picked fights. But there was much less of that behavior overall. The Trump Twitter archive records 287 Trump tweets and retweets in August 2017 compared to 680 in August but yes, your Menzies. Last month. And the volume seems to have been turned up along with the frequency. Today's Trump is not just more prone to misspeaking and stumbling. He is also more overtly confrontational more of the time, more immersed in a daily cycle of presidential punditry, and more casually incendiary with his words and sentiments. Is he finding it harder to break through? Does he simply have fewer meetings on his schedule and more free time? Maybe it's all of the aforementioned. Trump has such little confidence in his third and current chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, that he's still not removed Mulvaney's title of acting White House boss more than eight months into his tenure. It's also true that the outrage cycle that Trump's presidency has become requires more fuel than it did two years ago when the wacky pronouncements and shrill insults emanating directly from the Oval Office were still seen as shocking novelty. Sure enough, the anger and abuse have dramatically and notably increased. Twice years ago, Trump used his feed to criticize, belittle, or humiliate specific targets 14 times in the months of August. Interestingly, many were Republican senators who were still offering him resistance, including publicity-seeking Lindsey Graham, who is now one of his most faithful public promoters, and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, whom Trump then disparaged as a loser. But in August of this year, the numbers shot up. Our president made or shared 52 direct insults on his Twitter feed, by my count. Many were aimed at individual members of the media, from crazy Lawrence O'Donnell of MSNBC, to lunatic Chris Cuomo of CNN, to psycho Mika Brzezinski of MSNBC, and pathetic Juan Williams of Fox News. 
Other targets who were singled out included the Three Stooges running against me in the GOP primary, Denmark, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Euro, car company executives, sleepy-eyed Joe Beaton. On August 10th, Trump wrote specifically of Joe, Does anybody really believe he'd be mentally fit to be president? Uh, I... What do you say to that? <laughs> Beto O'Rourke was attacked. Liberal Hollywood. The true racist. The quote-unquote anti-Semite representative Rashida Tlaib. The nutjob Anthony Scaramucci. The former Trump White House communications director who finally broke with his former boss last month. And in a retweet to start off the month, the nipple height mayor of Londonistan. Now, another frequent target was the Federal Reserve and its Trump-appointed chairman, Jeremy Powell. Now, for months, Trump has been crusading against Powell in what appears to be an unprecedented public pressure campaign to turn the Fed into an arm of the president's re-election campaign. In August, Trump's focus on the Fed dramatically escalated. As fears mounted about a slowing economy and the intensifying trade war with the Communist Chinese Empire. So I counted 30 separate tweets by Trump in August criticizing Jay Powell or the Fed, in which the president variously referred to clueless Jay Powell, complaining about Powell's horrendous lack of vision, and most strikingly, on August 23rd, blamed the Fed for Communist China's alleged currency manipulation. On that day, Trump actually tweeted, My only question is, who is our bigger enemy? Jay Powell or Chairman Xi? Of course, Trump's biggest enemy and most frequent target, 12 years are gone and today, remainest what he called the corrupted fake news. At 5.46 p.m. on August 27th, and the fake and corrupt news, but three minutes later. All told, hashtag crooked journalism, as he called it on August 18th, was the subject of 26 complaining tweets in August of 2017, and 80 of them this August. This escalation seems to be by design rather than the result of indiscipline or passing fits of anger, at least in the sense that, as Trump himself said in a tweet last month, he hopes his criticism of the media will be one of the lasting accomplishments of his tenure. <sighs> to quote his tea verbatim, When the age of Trump is looked back on many years from now, I only hope that a big part of my legacy will be exposing... The massive dishonesty in the fake news. Now, there be little doubt that Trump has also decided to explicitly attack the media as part of his re-election campaign, a plan that he broadcast in an August 10th tweet writing, Never has the press been more inaccurate, unfair, or corrupt. We're not fighting the Democrats. They are easy. We're fighting the seriously dishonest and unhinged lamestream media. They have gone totally crazy. He wrote that in all uppercase, the last word. I'm trying to read it true to form. Oh, my God. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I, I can't go too far with this. I'm just... just Honestly, it leaves me weak. At August G7 summit in Biarritz, France, Trump even claimed that other world leaders were commiserating with him about negative coverage by the American press. <sighs> to quote is he verbatim, The question I was asked most today by fellow world leaders who think the USA is doing so well and is stronger than ever before happens to be, Mr. President, 
Why does the American media hate your country so much? Why are they rooting for it to fail? Now, not a single one of those world leaders stepped forward to validate Trump's claim. Although many were subject to another, perhaps surprising aspect of his Twitter feed, the increasing tendency to use it as a vehicle not only for threats and critiques, but also for blandishments and over-the-top praise. This, too, seems more purposeful, at least more self-consciously executed, than many of Trump's critics would actually allow us. On Saturday, during his end-of-the-month social media spree, Trump methodically ticked off a list of tweets and retweets, individually praising most of the members of the Senate Republican Conference, including targets of his ire two Augusts gone, such as Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham. And like his insults, Trump's praise has become ever more flamboyant, and the list of those whom he Twitter flattered this August included populist and personated elitist nationalists, such as South Asian India's Narendra Modi and Brazil's Jair Bolsonaro, the great leader and good man, Xi Jinping of the Communist Chinese Empire, and the shambolic and duplicitous new pro-Brexit British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, whom I'll have to address soon enough tonight. The naivete of Trump's praise is sometimes as alarming as the vitriol of his hatred. On August 15th, with fears rising of a communist Chinese crackdown on protesters in Hong Kong, Trump tweeted, If President Xi would meet directly and personally with the protesters, there would be a happy and enlightened ending to the Hong Kong problem. I have no doubt. And on August 10th, Trump revealed a letter from Kim Jong-un in which the North Korean dictator very nicely asked for a meeting while offering a small apology for his latest missile test and claimed that the test would end when South Korean American military exercises did. And of course, these tests did not end when United States South Korean military exercises did. They actually increased. Now, 20 years ago, the president's use of Twitter was still so unprecedented that his aides would warn journalists and foreign counterparts not to take it too seriously. But now, as the president's online pronouncements and a stream of daily commentary have almost subsumed all regular policymaking, few dispute the significance of having an around-the-clock, unfiltered presidential feed. It be, therefore, all the more striking that Trump's major policy preoccupation this past August, his trade war with the Communist Chinese Empire, was the subject of his most contradictory, confusing, and hard-to-parse statements. I counted more than 40 fucking tweets mentioning Communist China last month. They veered wildly, almost day-to-day, hour-to-hour, on whether a deal or a whole new round of tariffs was imminent. On August 23rd, Trump issued decree that stands out as his most remarkable. At 10.59 a.m., Donald Trump directed American corporations via Twitter to shut down their businesses with Communist China. So texting, Our great American companies are hereby ordered to immediately start looking for an alternative to China. And markets as they did repeatedly throughout the month of confusing presidential commentary, swooned. But it seems that the markets have moved on, and so probably have the lot of yourselves. We're barely 96 hours into September, and the president has already claimed that he's never heard of a Category 5 hurricane, got into a public spat with the star of the situation comedy entitled Will and Grace, congratulated Poland on the anniversary of the Nazi-Soviet invasion circa 1939, 
and played more golf at a Trump resort. This being why the Muslim mayor of London mocked Donald Trump for dealing with a hurricane out on the golf course. Now, Donald Trump canceled his weekend trip to Poland in order to monitor Hurricane Dorian. And Sunday, Trump proved he listens intently to his weather briefings, claiming he'd never heard of a Category 5 hurricane before, despite the fact of four such hypercanes having actually occurred while Trump's played president. But despite all the urgency, Trump managed to get in several rounds of golf this weekend and found time to attack a sitcom star who had slighted him. Because the eastern seaboard will fully recover at some point in the not-too-distant future, whereas repairing Donald Trump's shattered ego be a full-time job. And oh yes, people noticed. From Politico magazine, <clears throat> to read is what they wrote, London Mayor Sadiq Khan, who traveled to Poland to attend a commemoration ceremony on Sunday, told Politico's London playbook, he's clearly busy dealing with a hurricane out on the golf course. Now, Khan also took aim at the United States president for emboldening racists to speak out from the fringes of society. To quote his Khan at length at ver verbatim, these people have been inspired by mainstream politicians who subscribe to their point of view. Trump is a guy who amplifies racist tweets, amplifies the tweets of phobics, says things that be deeply objectionable. If I don't stand up and call that out, I think I'm doing a disservice to Londoners who chose me as their mayor. And we have, um, I think, um, we can easily assess via Google search exclusive video of Trump's reaction. Uh, it was played out by William Shatner in the Wrath of Khan movie. If you look up that scene, where Trump and his crew are abandoned in some Genesis Project uh, site while uh, Khan takes off in a starship. And you have William Shatner screaming, Khan! <laughs> now they say via quantum physics, that a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can, given enough time, set off a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. I imagine the torrent of spittle discouraging from Trump's KFC hole after he reads various quotes echoing the Muslim mayor of Londonistan that this would greatly expedite the process and put our country in harm's way again quite soon with the next Cat 5 hypercane. But don't worry. Despite canceling his trip to Poland to play that game, Trump insisted he would never, ever play as president. Yet, keeps doing. He managed to give a shout-out to the Polish people and congratulate them on the anniversary of their being invaded and crushed by both the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. So, oh my god. It was on, how would I say it? The latest bullshit response to a mass shooting that Trump made mouth noises about gun violence saying, well, we're looking at a lot of different things. We're looking at a lot of different bills, ideas, concepts. It's been going on for a long time. And then Trump admitted background checks aren't enough, but said, it's a mental problem. It, yeah, it's his. And that's when a reporter asked him, do you have a message for Poland on the 80th anniversary of World War II? And Trump said, I do have a great message for Poland. And we have Mike Pence, our vice president, is just about landing right now. I just want to congratulate Poland. Uh, for, you know, for being smashed by the National Socialism circa 1939. Oh, hey, thanks for the trivia about polls in America, Donald. 
But that had absolutely nothing to do with the question. You have to ask, does Trump have any idea when World War II started in Europe or why? Uh, it's a silly question, I know, but that brings us to the great Indian disenfranchisement, which will circle us right back to Trump. Why is India designating 1.9 million residents as foreigners? Now, on Saturday, this Labor Day weekend, nigh 2 million residents of India's northeastern state of Assam learned that their names were left off a controversial citizen's register, putting them at risk of becoming stateless. Now, South Asian India's NRC, its National Registry of Citizens, is meant to track Indian nationals living in Assam, which experienced waves of mass migration circa 1947, when India became independent, and circa 1971, when East Pakistan became Bangladesh. Now, Assam shares a 163-mile border with Bangladesh, and a third of its 32 million residents be Muslim, the second highest ratio after India administered Kashmir. And the NRC, the National Register of Citizens, first compiled circa 1951, marks residents of Assam as foreigners if they cannot prove they lived there before Bangladesh declared independence on March 24th of 1971. Updating the NRC was a key pledge of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's 2019 election campaign. So what happens next? The people who didn't make the NRC list can appeal to so-called foreigners' tribunals, but the process will be messy, may even become bloody. The government has allowed only 120 days for the nigh 2 million residents to prove they have the paperwork to stay. And paperwork be a problem in India. Not only are names frequently misspelled or incorrectly transliterated, but many people lack land deeds or legitimate proof of residence. Daily wage laborers will lose valuable working hours trying to clear their status. It's difficult to imagine a few hundred tribunals handling nearly two million petitions within three months. And Amnesty International has already called those courts biased and discriminatory. There's also the question of what to do with the people India declares to be foreigners. Can they be deported? In July, Bangladeshi Foreign Minister A.K. Abdul Momen was quoted as saying, We can not take any more people, adding that Bangladesh was already the most densely populated country on the planet. Now, given that deportations seem infeasible. One option could be that excluded residents get work permits but lose their right to vote. And that's what brings us to the clash of civilization between Hindus and Muslims. As the Indian website I checked out, scroll.in, points out, it is not entirely accurate to say the NRC has an inherent bias against Muslims. Many Bengali Hindus have also been excluded from the citizens' list, which explains why the ruling uh, BJP, acronymous for the Bharatiya Janata Party, has expressed concern over the process. Still, judging by what BJP leaders have said about the NRC, fears about the party targeting Muslims are not unfounded. In April, then-BJP President Amit Shah referred to Muslim immigrants from Bangladesh as termites and, in a barely disguised dog whistle, stated that his party would give citizenship to Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and Sikhs from Bangladesh and Pakistan. If the BJP passes its proposed citizenship amendment bill, 
a way for non-Muslim refugees to gain Indian papers, then Hindus who failed to make the NRC could find a way back in. Shah, who is now Home Minister and the second most powerful person in India, has promised to extend Assam's NRC to the entire fucking country over more than a billion people. Take Modi's BJP seriously, and literally. In October of the 2016th year of our Lord, the Silicon Valley billionaire Peter Thiel, the gay lover of Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who was once a woman and listed himself as such on all of his voting papers for decades, who had a sex change or sexual affirmation surgery, as my surrogate son taught me to reference it as, and therefore is totally incapable of producing the children that were birthed by Ivanka, we can only assume they're all either Trump's children, fucking his own daughter, or in vitro fertilization was involved. So, Jared Kushner, of course, was the connection for support of Donald Trump that sourced from Peter Thiel, who himself famously weighed in on press coverage of then-presidential candidate Donald Trump by saying that the media never takes him seriously, but it always takes him literally. Now, voters did exactly the opposite, taking Trump's campaign quirk seriously, but not literally. In India, it's time to take Narendra Modi both literally and seriously. Circa 1998, the BJP delivered on its promise to test a nuclear weapon. Since becoming Prime Minister, Narendra Modi has been making good, with mixed results, on promises to clamp down on corruption. Now, in his second term, Modi has delivered on campaign pledges to revoke Kashmir's autonomy and to update the NRC. Other promises such as the BJP's long-standing goal to build a Hindu temple at the site of a demolished mosque in Ayodhya, may well be next. Nobody should be surprised anymore. Narendra Modi's moves have already been widely telegraphed and endorsed in the world's largest historical election in human history in the world's largest democracy, Asian India. Now, the Trump administration's new public charge rule is our NRC of North America, which could allow us the federal government to deny green cards to immigrants who use Medicaid or other forms of public assistance and is already having a chilling effect on benefits for immigrants' children. Now, an acquaintance of mine, Tom K. Wong, the director of the United States Immigration Policy Center at UC San Diego, has pointed out that the results of a new survey show us the Trump administration is not abiding by the law. From substandard conditions in immigration detention to abuse to due process concerns. And it will only get worse. Cruelty, after all, being the very point of the Republican program. The Trump administration has attempted to close the door on asylum seekers who be seeking refuge in these United States. But even as it blocks entry and sends tens of thousands of asylum seekers to Mexico to wait out their immigration proceedings. 
Thousands of families with children are also being held in federal immigration detention facilities. Because the administration has prohibited advocacy groups, journalists and immigration attorneys and even congressional staff from entering detention facilities to document conditions and interview detainees, the public has had only anecdotal glimpses into how detainees were treated. But now we have systematic evidence to support accounts of the harsh conditions that asylum seekers experience in immigration detention. In many ways, it'd be much worse than we thought. From October of yesteryear through June of this year, the San Diego Rapid Response Network, acronymous as SDRRN, assisted approximately 7,300 asylum-seeking families at their shelters. These families, who were processed and then admitted into these United States, totaled more than 17,000 people, including 7,900 children five years old or younger. Now, Team Wong at the United States Immigration Policy Center, acronymous at as USIPC, or USIPSI, at UC San Diego, independently analyzed intake data collected by the SDRRN for all of these families. And in a report released last week, we found that approximately 35% of the asylum-seeking heads of households that Mr. Wong studied reported problems related to conditions in immigration detention, treatment in immigration detention, or medical issues. Now this finding be alarming since it's very likely an underestimation because the SDRRN was focused on providing needed services to the asylum-seeking families not administering questionnaires. Moreover, abuses or problems in detention may be underreported by asylum seekers who be afraid that raising complaints may negatively affect their asylum case. Of those who reported issues related to conditions in detention, approximately 6 out of 10 reported food and water problems, including not having enough to eat, being fed frozen food, being fed spoiled food, not being given formula for infants, not being given water, and having to drink dirty or foul-tasting water. Approximately half reported having to sleep on the floor or having to sleep with the lights on, overcrowded conditions, confinement, and the temperature being too cold in La Ialara, the detention facilities known as ice boxes. Approximately one out of every three reported not having access to clean or sanitary toilets, being able to shower, or even being able to brush their teeth. About one in, out of ten of the asylum-seeking heads of households or more than 700 of them, reported verbal abuse, physical abuse, or some form of mistreatment in immigration detention. Examples of verbal abuse include being told, We don't want your kind here! And, You're an ape! Among so many others. Examples of physical abuse include being thrown against the wall when attempting to get a drink of water. The data also showed the great diversity of those who arrive at the southern border to seek refuge. The majority of asylum-seeking families came from the northern triangle of Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. However, many also came from other continents, 28 in all, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Russia, Kazakhstan, India, Communist China, and Vietnam, to name but a few. Any changes to United States asylum policies meant to deter Central Americans from entering at the southern border 
will affect asylum seekers from all over the world who will also be looking towards these United States for safety. We also found that just over one out of five of these families do not speak Spanish as their primary language. The languages spoken range from indigenous Central American languages, including Kiiche, Huachi, and Mam, to Creole, Mandarin Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, Indi, Vietnamese, and Romanian, among others. This linguistic diversity presents another set of challenges. When asylum seekers be released from detention, they be given detailed instructions on a form called the Notice to Appear, including instructions about their immigration court dates, times, and locations. On this notice, immigration officials indicate the language that the asylum seeker was given these instructions in. For those whose primary language is not Espanol or Spanish, nearly nine out of every ten were nevertheless given instructions in Spanish. If these families are not approved or provided instructions about their immigration proceedings in a language they can even understand, they will never be able to navigate an extremely complex legal process which may infringe on their basic rights to due process. Mm. From substandard conditions in immigration detention to verbal and physical abuse to serious due process concerns, all the data proves that the Trump administration is not abiding by its obligations under United States and international asylum and refugee law to treat humanely those who be seeking protection from persecution. With the administration now determined to hold asylum-seeking families for potentially as long as it takes for their immigration proceedings to play out, which could be years and years, conditions can only get worse. Cruelty, after all, being the very point of the Republican program. And now, the whites in area be between a border wall and a hard place. United States Defense Secretary Mark Esper has signed off on the diversion of military construction funds to build President Donald Trump's promised border wall with Mexico, marking the first test of his ability to walk a precarious political tightrope. So the Republicans have chosen Trumpism over both property rights and the rule of law. Trump is just who he said he'd be four years ago, as be Narendra Modi. Hence the parallel, and hence my diversion into South Asian India, but earlier. And by rallying around the American Modi, Republicans are choosing to brand themselves in Trump's image. Now, in more placid times, news that the President of these United States was encouraging aides to break the law by seizing swaths of private property along the southwestern border to build a goddamn wall might have caused more than a day's ripple. After all, legitimate controversy over the promiscuous threat of eminent domain as well as illegitimate fears of a NAFTA superhighway, dogged former Texas Governor Rick Perry for a full fucking decade, prompting him to eventually abandon his dreams of a trans-Texas corridor toll road. And Perry wasn't out there dangling pardons and barking, take the land, to his staff. As former Fox News and current CNN host Allison Camarota asserted, Wednesday midweek last, any time there was any suggestion about President Obama using eminent domain for anything, Roger Ailes, and therefore Fox News, blew a gasket about the idea of seizing private land. Now, we, as adults, 
be accustomed to some ideological shape-shifting when the White House changes teams. But what's so striking about this week's slate of immigration-related controversies, including the one that supplanted the land grab pardon, the administration's new rules governing potential citizenship for the children of United States service people abroad, is that none of it should come as a surprise. This is how Trump ran. This is how he won the grand old party primary. This is how he beat Hillary Clinton. This is how he has governed. So the question for Republicans becomes, is this how your party will henceforth be known? Four years ago on this month, Trump and the rest of the Republican field engaged in some of the most gruesome restrictionist one-upmanship American politics had seen in the last two decades. People rightly remember the rapist accusation in the president's campaign kickoff, but some of his real crazy came later. Trump telling NBC's Chuck Todd that the U.S. citizen children of illegal immigrants, of which there be an estimated 4 million, have to go, vowing to deport legal Syrian refugees, ending birthright citizenship, constitution be damned, a stance that sadly many of his competitors aped, that Trump rocketed to the head of a crowded field with such startling rhetoric and policies suggested a conservative appetite for uh, immigration enforcement that would never have been sated by Mitt Romney's self-deportation stance, which Trump back in November of 2012 called maniacal, or John McCain's embarrassing about-face on big-picture immigration law reform. Before you knew it, candidate Bobby Jindal was using words like invasion. Scott Walker was pondering a wall on the northern border. Chris Christie was proposing to track legal immigrants like FedEx packages. And even hapless old Jeb Bush was warning darkly against acre babies. Now I'm told I'm offline. So I'll need other people to verify this. I thank his chair Shields for letting me know. Let me follow up with this because hopefully I'm still recording. And let me check my channel dashboard. Live chat disconnected. Okay. Unable to connect chat. Please try again later. All right. Where am I now? Stream health in question. 32 still watching. Let's hope they stay here through this. Okay, let me see if I can contact technical support, if that's possible. It still says I'm live now, so let's try a Skype call. See if that's possible. Shrink down the screen a little bit here, and I need to hear other people confirming or contradicting what our girl Sarah Shields just said. Let me see if I can contact Brendan. The guy's probably got his cell phone on recharge. You're going to hear maybe something. And maybe I'm offline in general. Oh, there we are. There he is, ring. See if that brings him on. Okay. Uh, Hey, can you hear me? I'm told I'm offline. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm told I'm offline. Oh, let me check. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Holly Kaditis Kiefer and Sarah Shields both say I'm offline. I'll take advantage of this to check the... uh... Yes, it seems you are no longer online. What do we do? Try stopping the OBS and then restarting it. Okay. 
Um, let me try that. Now, does that mean I was recording the whole time? Because it still says stop streaming. Yeah, when you press, yeah, press, um, yeah, press stop streaming, and then you'll see it create the the file, the okay. MP3. So, so everything I said was recorded at least. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. let me press stop streaming. Uh, uh, this is what you said, right? Press stop streaming. Yeah, press stop streaming.